Welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, March 19th. Uh, we will start with roll call. Mr. Draper. Ms. Atkins. Here. Mr. Jensen. Here. Mayor Abu Asli. Here. Mr. Sternad. Mr. Brandt. Here. Ms. Gadelia. Here. Okay. Um, first on our agenda, we have some introductions. So we have uh, events coordinator. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to introduce our new part-time event coordinator. She joined us in January and um, is working with me in the communications division. And I'll give her a couple minutes to um, introduce her background and what she's been working on. So this is Jessica Carney. Welcome, Jessica. Hello. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, like Amber said, I started just about two months ago as, I believe, the first ever event coordinator for you are. Marion, which is exciting. Um, I've worked in events for about 10 years in one form or another. Um, both Amber and I actually worked at the U.S. Cellular Center in Cedar Rapids at different times. Um, I worked at the Czech and Slovak Museum in Cedar Rapids and most recently at Coe College. Um, so I've worked at quite a few big events and lots of small events too, so quite a range. Um, I'm also a writer. I do quite a bit of freelance work, so I'm excited to be able to help with some of the communications tasks like the Marion Messenger when needed. Um, the first thing I've really jumped in on is the fireworks event coming up on July 3rd, which I'm sure you've all heard of at this point, which we're excited about. Um, we're working with a really great committee for that event to make sure all the logistics run smoothly and that everything is safe, even if we get a big crowd out there. Um, I'm also happy to say we've had lots of sponsorship interest for that event, so that's been very successful. So people, I think, are really excited about it. Um, the next step is we'd really like to add a few more events, especially to the Uptown Artway, which doesn't have a lot of programming at this point. Um, so I've been trying to methodically think through what events would be best. Um, I've had a chance to meet with um, park staff, library staff, and even an uptown <coughs> business in the, in the uptown Marion district. Um, and we also sent an event survey out through Facebook and the Marion Messenger just to the people of Marion to see what's important to them when they attend an event and what events they're interested in seeing added. So. Um, I felt strongly that it's important to really ask people what they want before we just go ahead and plan something, so I was excited to get a good number of responses to that. Um, so now, really, just in the last two weeks or so, we've been starting to build, uh, hopefully, an event schedule with a few new events based on all that information that we've collected. Um, I've also joined... Uh, a committee of other event planners in the area through the Cedar Rapids Metro Economic Alliance so we can hopefully schedule things in an intelligent way and not schedule competing events against each other. So I think that'll be great. Um, I've also recently started working on looking at the process for when someone wants to book an event um, and fill out a hold harmless or fill out something like a special event application. I think there's some room to make that a little bit smoother, a little bit easier for rental clients um, going through that process. Um, that kind of came about because we were looking at the website redesign and what it looks like if you're interested in holding a special event with the City of Marion. Um, so we've been doing some research into computer programs that might assist with that and even maybe help people apply for things online, pay online, and just see if we can improve that process a little bit. Um, but that's that's a summary of what I've been working on so far. Thank you. Um, yeah. I like that you are, uh, are seeking public input on, on the programming they'd want to see. I think it's very important. Yeah. Um, look forward to seeing what you're going to come up with. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's going to be great. We're glad to have you on board. Thank any, you. Any questions or comments? Yes. Here, I right have time. one. Uh, again, too, I'm going to congratulate you. I know I've already told you that, uh, but I am super excited to have you and this position with our city. One of the things that I would ask as we move forward, and I know it's a discussion that we've had in the past, is um, the public um, that, I, that I represent, uh, that we visit with, are still struggling to find that one website to go to, to look at those events. 
Um, sometimes they have to go to parks, sometimes they have to go to City Hall's website, sometimes they have to go to this site, that site, and it's difficult to find those things. Or if maybe they signed up for something and they're trying to follow it to see if weather conditions are going to change and it's been postponed, delayed, mm -hmm. um, that's the, probably the number one biggest concern that I'm hearing from the public. Um, and primarily my wife, because she <laughs> she follows it as well. So you might hear me bring this up occasionally from time to time, but uh, I know you're working on that. But yeah. again, too, if somehow there was a conduit that allowed these to tie together somehow to make it user friendly, I know the parks is just now putting out some new stuff out there, and I've seen that it appears on one spot and not on another. So anyway, huh. if there's some way we could help pull that together, that would be great. So I don't again, too, I don't know how that's done, but um, any, anything that we could do to pull those um, items into one uh, platform would be great. So anyway, Absol thank you. Though. Absolutely, yeah, it helps. I think that just being new, I can think from that outsider perspective too of what what would be the easiest. And I have used several computer systems in the past, and especially yeah, and especially too with social media too. So now uh, all of a sudden we've got that platform that we're working with. So sometimes you may see it on Facebook, but you don't see it on the website, or vice versa. So yeah. anyway, thank, thank you. you. Definitely, thank you. Council, mm -hmm. Council Member Atkins. Welcome. Um, glad to have yeah. you. What have you found from the survey so far? Can you just give us kind of a quick overview of what yeah. everyone's telling you? Absolutely. Yeah, there are a couple of kind of interesting things that came about through the survey. Um, I asked people what's most important to them when they attend events and gave them <laughs> options like cost, parking, kind of things that I thought people would answer, but they actually picked quality entertainment as the most important thing to them. And I thought that was interesting. And could mean that there's some potentials to maybe even charge for events where we're not. Um, really, I believe it was 44% of people clicked quality entertainment as the number one thing over cost and parking. Um, they also answered that um, the group that needs more programming is adults. Um, I would have maybe made the assumption people would answer kids, but and that's really why I wanted to send this survey, because actually people overwhelmingly clicked adults as needing some more events and programming. So. That's just a very, very brief summary of those survey results. So. <coughs> so, other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, we have another n introduction. Mike? We do. Um, I'd like to uh, have the opportunity uh, to uh, introduce our new deputy director uh, for the Parks and Rec Department, uh, Seth Stashelm. Um, and uh, Seth has been with us uh, for approximately about uh, 36 hours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, uh, we're throwing him right in the fire uh, and helping to do uh, flood repair. <laughs> so with, uh, with that, uh, Seth, I'll let you introduce yourself too and just uh, address the council. Yeah, Thank thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I'm Seth Stashel. I uh, am coming here from Atlantic, Iowa. I was serving as the park director for the city of Atlantic. Uh, I've been with the city of Atlantic for five years uh, now. I've, uh, in the past, I've served with, with the city of Atlantic, city of Maryville, and also the uh, uh, YMCAs of, of Atlantic and also the greater Oklahoma City uh, YMCAs. Uh, me and my wife are pretty excited to uh, join this community and uh, I'm excited to join an already successful parks department um, and be a part of their continued success. So thank you. Welcome. Great to have you. Good to have you here. Um, questions? Yes. More of a comment. Um, so welcome and I'm glad to hear that you have some why experience because I'm sure you've heard about a yeah. partnership with programming so that'll um, that'll come into play. And I also just want to say, um, I, I love so many things about the city, obviously, but parks was the first impression for me as mm -hmm. a newcomer when I came eight years ago um, from the East Coast. The, I mean, it's just so pristine and we've got so many great parks and um, it's a wonderful department. So pressure's on. Yeah, uh, well, I agree. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd like to obviously as, as well welcome you uh, to our community and uh, like I always tell people is there's many communities but you chose ours and um, obviously there was a reason that you were chosen so uh, congratulations um, and we yes we are that is uh, one of our top items obviously for the community but uh, um, 
I'm sh uh, how crazy. Uh, we all welcome to our city and grab your boots, huh? So yeah, uh, I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank welcome. You. All right, another presentation from Marion Leadership in Action is next. Hi. Hi, I'm Holly Corkery. I'm from the Marion Leadership in Action class this year. There's a couple members from our class. They want to wave also here this afternoon. They didn't know I was going to call Welcome, them out like that. all of you. <laughs> um, so some of you may know since 2011, Marion Leadership in Action has cultivated Marion's leaders. Um, this year's class includes representatives of city government, um, the private sec some private sector businesses, and local nonprofits. I know that I have and the rest of my classmates, we've really enjoyed the opportunity to learn more about Marion this year and to become closer connected with the community. Um, through the class, we have realized part of what makes Marion such a great place to live, work, play, and shop is the welcoming nature of the community. I think you all would agree. Um, one of the examples of that welcoming nature that we have here in Marion is the Reach Higher banners that you see lining lot, um, several of the streets throughout town. The banners were a gift from a previous Marion Leadership in Action class. And we've learned some of the hard work that goes into getting something like the banners going and how to raise funds and things like that. And through that, um, we noted that the banners are starting to look tattered in some areas due to rain, snow, mother nature, time, those sorts of things. Um, and what we decided to do as a class is to replace some of those banners that are starting to look tattered um, and worn. So we endeavored on a fundraising project to get that done. And um, so we can continue to have a welcoming symbol into this community that we can all be proud of. So to date, um, to date we've raised approximately $2,800. Um, we're just shy of that. And we have a $500 donation coming in that's been promised to us, and we hope to get that number closer to $4,000. And what we're coming here to ask you all today is to match that up to $4,000, whatever we get donated, um, if that's something that you'd like to do. I, it's something in the past that councils have been willing to do, and uh, we would very much appreciate your support again this year. If you have any questions, I would be happy to take those. Um, I know this is set for an agenda item at the council on Thursday also. Yes, Ms. Gabriela. Um, so congratulations because I know that the banner program recently was recognized for, I don't remember specifically if it was innovation or cool it was, community project. It won the, the best beautification project at the uh, Main Street uh, yeah. Iowa Awards. Beautification, yeah. that's it. So I, I think it's a great and unique project. Um, I think, though, I recall that it was last year that it was started, right? And um, we were asked for a match. So the banners were only a well, year that was old, the, is that right? Th this, the, 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 uh, the banners of the service people. I'm confusing two the, things. Yeah, that, that, that program is what won the award. And um, So the banners that you're asking about are not for the service people. They are just the Marion Reach Hire. So for example, I live on North Albernet Road, mm -hmm. and when you drive in the roundabout at Tower Terrace on Albernet Road, there are the reach higher banners. I don't know if any of you live out that way or go out that way, but the wind howling at my house at night is scary. I don't even want to know what's happening to those banners up there just because there's not a lot of construction to break it. So those are some of the examples of banners that are getting to be tattered and worn that, and that need to be replaced, really. So my question is just how um, how long did they last before the ones you are going to replace? I'm just curious if you know when. I don't know if any of my classmates. Two years. Three to five years. Oh, okay. Wow, that's pretty good in these winters. Okay, that was my question. I, I was confusing it and thought these are the ones we got last year, and then I was concerned. A lot of banner we projects go, like, yeah. going on. It's a good idea. <coughs> yeah, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So are, are we replacing all of them or, or just certain? Um. We would go in order of what would be, um, and we would work with uh, Ryan Miller and Public Service and talk with them about what needed to be replaced and go in order of urgency. And we would just go with what um, our funds would get However at this point. However many we can and with then, the funds. Yeah. Okay. And it's the two type, there's two different ones, right? There's the ones that, that say reach higher and the ones that say Marion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm getting yes from the back of the room. <laughs> I see a nod from Amber, so, okay. Yes. It takes this a good team, right, guys? Yes. <laughs> the, I was just quickly doing the math here. Is your ask then for $700 or? Our, our ask is to match up to 400 so it's 4, up to 4, 400 What? Or 4000 excuse me. <laughs> our ask is up to 4000 Okay, very good. Thank you for that clarification. Right now it would be, it's, um, we're at 20 Seven or $2,775. We have a $510, if you want the exact numbers, a $510 donation promised. And we would hope to get that number even closer to 4000 but that's where we're at exactly right now. Okay. okay. Other questions or comments? Okay. Um, so will there be an action item? There is an action item. On, on, the, on, on the agenda. Thing. Okay. And if we were to approve that, is that something like that already budgeted, or where does that come from? Yeah, we've been putting some dollars in the communications budget for match for that. Okay, so that comes out of communications budget? Yeah. Commodities, I think. That's okay. And, all right. Perfect. Thank you for you everything all. you're doing, and uh, hope you're enjoying the class. It, it's been a really great experience, so thank you for How supporting. How many people are in the class? Hmm. Jill would probably know that. 15. 15. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's been a great experience. So thank you guys. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, just to clarify, it was the, the banner program for the service members um, that, that won the award, and I understand it's being replicated. Or <laughs> our other, other cities are looking at replicating the program, looking at Marion's uh, program. So it's a. Uh, uh, a great compliment, I think, to Uptown Marion and the Chamber and everyone involved with that project. So, thank you. All right, on to the um, consent agenda section. Uh, there's nothing starred on, on the first page, but if there's anything anyone would like to single out to discuss, please, please do so at this time. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next page. Uh, we have Item eight uh, starred, but if there's anything else before that, feel free to, to bring that up right now. Okay, then we'll move on to number eight. Number eight is that long awaited correspondence policy you guys have been um, asking about, and that just kind of gives the direction as to how different items will be handled when they come into the city. So if something comes in and the clerk receives an email that um, is addressed to all of council that will be forwarded on to you um, all of you will get a copy of that so you'll still see everything but it doesn't necessarily need to go on for receive and file and like every week um, Mike has TAC requests that come in but we don't necessarily know if there's support for them so probably the most important part of this policy will be how to deal with action items and those items generally we've put on the agenda for receive and file and potentially for extra action um, just in general, I gave a list of, of examples of things that there's requests for action that don't necessarily need to be on the council agenda. <coughs> like if somebody is asking for certain updates or if somebody says, hey, I'd really love for you guys to build a roundabout right here because we get a ton of requests for that, right? Um, then engineering can say, you know what, that's already in the plans. And you guys can see that that, that um, correspondence came in and that Mike answered that but we don't necessarily need to put that just because it's an action request on the agenda. And then there's a more detailed section for the TAC request for what's required before we put it on the agenda so that we're not having a bunch of staff time and, and resources spent on a request that maybe one person wants and then we notice the neighborhood and we get 90% of the people affected come in and they don't want it. And so that way we're kind of weeding those things out before we send them to TAC and spend the time on them. And then, of course, um, all planning and zoning requests will still come to your attention as received and file. Uh, that's something we feel that you guys need to know about. And, of course, if there is something when you receive, say you all receive a copy of a letter and you feel that it needs to come to a full group discussion, you can always send it to Rachel and say, hey, I think this needs to be discussed in council or it can be something where a staff member receives something that maybe normally wouldn't be on the agenda, but they feel that it might require some action or some attention. That way they can still feel comfortable to put that on the agenda for discussion. 
And then um, obviously I would expect that you don't discuss that in group emails. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had a couple comments on the tax section if we could take a look at. I, I wanted to maybe put a little uh, some more teeth in here if possible. Um, for 1A, where it says for a request to add or remove street parking, it requires a minimum of 20 signatures or 80% of households. Do you think we can add after signatures like from that area so that somebody can't just be at like a barbecue on the other side of town and have relatives sign the petition? I feel like we should, you know, try to make sure that the people on the petition are the ones who are impacted by the decision. Yeah, I think what I, maybe now that you bring that to my attention, I think it would probably be a good idea if I change that to be a minimum of 20 signatures and down where it talks about of those using the street, maybe I add that to there as well. Yep. And then um, the other question I would have is, and I guess I should have thought about this ahead of time, I just kind of relied on, on Mike a lot there and put in what he had requested. Mike, do you want me to put in there something about 20 signatures or 80, whichever is more, whichever is less? I just kind of put the numbers in there to start the conversation to see how much Okay. Some of the issues that we would have is somebody might request similar to the one that we have west of Irish Drive and east of Alburnett where they request no parking on their street not realizing that to fix that it's going to take the entire neighborhood. And so that's kind of where we would have to then, by the way, you need to get this many signatures. So there would have to be some correspondence back and forth. So we'd have to have some kind of or per engineer's recommendation or something. Okay, I can I can put in there per engineer's recommendation, and then um, I can add in language as well that it's 20 signatures of people affected or using yeah, the and, street. Yeah, and then on the other ones like B, C, and D, I don't know, maybe it's all of them. Um, I th I think we should also, if it isn't a, on the broader policy, make sure they're all Marion residents as well. Um, I mean, I guess if we're making it specific to that area, then that would have to mean that. Um, then the only other comment I have is on number two under TAC. Um, it says, if a request is received without such a petition, staff shall notify the original requester that they must provide such documentation prior to the request being added to the council agenda. And then can we also add something about and that we would direct them to this policy? Because this is a new thing. So I think, you know, we should make that an official thing that we're going to tell them this exists and they should go look at it. Absolutely. Other than that, I'm thrilled to see it. Thanks for getting all this together. It looks good. And just, you know, more than likely, if I got a response, my response will probably have this attached to it because this has been adopted policy by council. Excellent. Mr. Jensen. Yeah, I made the assumption, and I think Renee brought up a good point. I made the assumption, although it's not clear from this now that I, she mentions the point, I made the assumption that when we talk about getting signatures, that if we're talking about, for example, on 1A about removing street parking, I made the assumption it would be the only signatures we would be considering would be people who live on that street, not somebody who lives across town. So I don't see the validity of any other signatures for somebody who lives across town as far as how it pertains to this. My second comment, particularly uh, to 1A, and it could apply to all of them, but on 1A and 1E, or see, yeah, 1A and 1E, we talk about a minimum of 20 or 80 percent. I would just soon see us talk about a percentage only. I don't think, you know, again, you can have a long street that has, you know, 50 houses on it. And if we're talking only 20, you know, that's 40 percent. I'd rather see the threshold put at a standard percentage and have that, maybe it's not 80, maybe it's 70, but I do want it, I would want to see that fairly high, yeah. that the majority of the people on that street want to do it. So I'd just as soon get rid of the 20, the number, and stick more with percentages. I'm not sure how that applies to a few of the others like 1D or 1F uh, where we talk about those. I know those don't come up quite as often. 1D is a little more restricted, uh, as is 1F. Uh, those are usually shorter areas, tighter spans of roads, uh, not quite as congested. So my comment really is more particularly about 1A and 1E. And I would like to see it clarified as to where the signatures do have to come from. Just to get a little more clarification from what you guys would like to see. Um, would it be perhaps a good idea for me to include um, residents 
and slash or property owners or business owners in the event that we have one of these requests that's in a commercial area or an area um, if there's a request sometimes the requests come in for things that are like by schools and so I, I don't know that we necessarily <coughs> want to limit that to just people who live in a particular area because we may get requests that are places where people don't live there or there may be people that are really impacted by those areas of traffic that aren't necessarily residents of that area like in the case of a school or if there's something in a commercial district. I, I could for those put Marion residents or property owners for areas that are non-residential or have a high amount of traffic from outside the neighborhood. I'm not sure how I'd word that uh, more artfully than I just did. I think you're going to have a difficult time getting anybody to sign something on an organization that is of that magnitude. Um, if it's a flower shop, the owner will, would be willing to sign it. If it's a corporate owned business from out of town, I don't think you're going to, I mean, you can get management. I mean, would, I mean, we really start to split the hairs there. So is the manager of the facility an authorized signer to sign the petition or not? I don't know. I mean, I could see this thing getting mm. cut down so many different times. I don't know how far we want to go with that. Yeah. This is already an improvement. I, I think oh, that, absolutely. Without a doubt. I think that might be why um, Mike had asked for the engineers to have some discretion where the signature should come from, and maybe that's the best way to do it. I would totally agree. Yeah. 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 And agree. just to Steve's point, the reason why some of them are just numbers is, for example, if I want the speed limit changed, Technically, I may live on the street and I want it lower. But there's other people that use the street that don't necessarily live on the street. And so some of those requests we've received from people that are actually using the street, not necessarily living on the street. So that's why I put a number of signatures. If I say percent, is that the percent of households or is that the percent that use it? Because if we look at AADT and there's 2,000 cars on it, do 20% of the cars that use that street then have to sign the petition? So that's why some of those I just tried to say, 20 signatures because then we're starting to get in the weeds and at least we have some people that said they, they want to do it. That's why I didn't do percentages on all of them. Well, you understand where I'm coming from. You know, right. I want, and, I, and want the, the I want the homework to be on the person that wants to bring in <coughs> a petition, not just a single person doing it. I want, you know, a lot more people behind it and, and if we're going to be talking about that, I want the majority of the people on that street be, you know, to back it up. But let's say that it's an intersection, so somebody wants a roundabout Green. going at 10th and Central. Who classifies to be in that intersection? So adding a stop sign, rapid flashing beacons. Um, and so in that case, that's where I just say 20 signatures because it's hard to say a certain percentage of the people that drive through that intersection. Yeah, my comment is really more about 1A and one. 1A and 1E. So. Okay. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, so thanks for putting this together. This is good. Um, question not about the TAC area of this, but back to the uh, number two under the policy itself, and it talks about applying to all correspondents. So. Um, <coughs> How does this work with us as council members when we receive a phone call or an email or uh, a question, right? Should we be logging or cataloging um, what <coughs> we're receiving? Everything you receive is actually a public record and subject to a public records request. So any emails you have, people can already ask for, but you don't necessarily need to log them. If you get something and you feel that it warrants a council discussion that's when you would ask for it to be added to the agenda but if it's something like say you get a question that's very specific to um, something that's already happening or happened at a meeting and you can answer that question that's a, a perfectly legitimate thing or you get an invitation to um, come to a school or some public event like that <coughs> that's not something you necessarily need to say hey I got this invitation did everybody else get this you don't need to send that on to everybody else. It's your correspondence is the same as everybody else here. Like, you guys don't get forwarded every email that every staff person gets, so you don't necessarily need to forward all of yours on either. So that makes sense. How about phone calls, right? So we get plenty of phone calls where we've got 
folks asking us questions or wanting to share their opinions. Mm -hmm. Should we be right cataloging or documenting that in some way so there's a record of that or so there's some consistency on how we are uh, so managing those correspondence? Phone calls aren't necessarily public records, so until you keep a log of it, then that log would be a public record. But if you don't keep a log of it, I would just maybe, if there's something that comes in of note, somebody calls you and says, hey, I really think this needs to happen in the city of Marion, and you hear them and you're like, you know, I think there's a lot of community support for this, let's, let's bring this forward, then that would be the point where you could bring that phone conversation. It would really be kind of at your discretion on that one. Um, unless it's something like you really feel is an emergency situation, then I would say um, contact whomever you need to to deal with that immediately. Um, but um, as far as I'm sure you get phone calls that are maybe just about, hey, what happened with this? Or what happened with that? Or, hey, we'd like our council member to come to this um, community meeting type situation. And you don't necessarily need to log all of those. Now, you might want to for your own benefit so you can say, I received this call and here's how I handled it but you don't necessarily need to do that. Nobody's going to check in. I'm not going to call you up and say, hey, did you do this? And if somebody calls and says, I want um, a record of all the phone calls you got and how you handled all of them, but you don't keep a log, then there's no public record to, to give. You don't have to create records for the public records request. So this isn't for us? Only if you receive some sort of correspondence. And it's also, it's more to direct staff on how to get correspondence to you that you need to see. And sometimes you guys will get correspondence that's more appropriately handled by a staff person, and so you can forward that on. But the primary purpose of this is for how city staff should deal with correspondence they receive, in particular, requests for action. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, under under public services, there's one item that's not starred. Anybody's questions on that? Otherwise, we'll move on to public safety. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I, in your packets, I gave you a memo uh, kind of explaining this whole situation. Um, we've been trying to sell some of our equipment that is outdated on gov deals and we have not been getting a good response maybe three dollars a helmet or something like that and then i received this email and this request and i felt it was important to make sure that our other firefighters brothers and sisters are safe so i would really like to see this uh, donation take place okay questions Thank you. I think it's that's a great thing. Thank you. Okay, on to engineering. Nothing under that that anyone else wants to discuss. Okay, under community development, we have one item starred. But if there's anything else that anyone wants to discuss on that agenda section, please uh, do so. Otherwise, we'll. We'll discuss item number two. Tom? So <clears throat> item number two is starred, but the, there's, it's setting the date for a public hearing. And there's three public hearings underneath that, actually four, I think, uh, identified. Um, so we're setting the date for the public hearing on, uh, on April 4th for the neighborhood in Indian Creek. Um, for those of you that have been around for a while, and uh, uh, Renee was on the Planning Commission, I think, mm -hmm. and we've seen this document. Um, this is a very lengthy planning document that's for the area out uh, north of 35th Avenue, east of 35th Street. Um, this is the uh, neighborhood plan. Uh, this area, uh, this document's been being put together by RDG. We've had a couple open houses on it um, and had pretty good response uh, to uh, to the public meetings we've had associated with it. So we're setting the date for the public hearing. The Planning Commission uh, reviewed the plan at their meeting, at their last meeting, and is recommending approval of that. So that plan would be forwarded to the, to the City Council for review as well, and then ultimately adoption. Associated with that, um, we would have a comprehensive plan map amendment. So this would be a, a larger area uh, out there. It really uh, would 
changed the comp plan south of Indian Creek Way all the way out to Highway 13 and then north of 35th Avenue. So there's a pretty lengthy uh, comp plan amendment associated. It's, it's also associated with the document, but it would be a separate action. And then uh, we would have a public uh, hearing um, going to, um, to rezone the property to the PDS district, which is laid out within the plan. So it's a pretty big public, meeting, or public hearing process to really adopt the plan, change the comp plan, and adopt the zoning out there. So we had uh, quite, a, I don't know, a small handful of folks at the Planning Commission meeting. Wouldn't surprise me if folks come to uh, uh, um, speak or hear about this, this document, that meeting. So just uh, we'll, we'll forward that out ahead of time since it is a lengthy document um, and go in that direction. So that's, those are the items that are on there. And it's really covering that area on the northeast side of the community. Um, the people that have uh, shown up and expressed any, you know, comments or concerns, what, what's, what's been the general gist so, of the um, concerns? Uh, some of it has been that it is a, a, a mixed-use development. It's compact development. Um, some of the lots are being proposed to be smaller. Uh, some of the concerns uh, have been that it's changing a little bit of the housing style and type. Um, but we've pointed out that this area, is a, it's been identified as a special place in Marion. We've with um, um, withheld some of the rezoning requests in the area um, because we want to see this plan uh, adopted. Uh, I think the council supported that plan and moving it forward. So there's some, uh, uh, just some different development standards out there for it and, and higher development standards. It does propose mixed use in apartments. Um, this really speaks to the affordability uh, uh, um, issue that we have with our housing market currently. So. That was some of it, and then uh, I think that was that's really the biggest thing is just the the mix of land uses and apartments. As we've heard before, there seems to be uh, some concern when apartments are going in. Okay. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was at the PNZ meeting when you discussed it last week. Uh, but and again, I've been at some other meetings regarding this. So I think it's a very exciting project, mm -hmm. of course, with the Linmar School. Going in there, I think everything happening out there may happen a little sooner than we all may anticipate. So with that said, one of the major pieces of this entire neighborhood is the large public park. And I believe that when we come to the public hearing, if we can have some more comments ready, uh, talking about the size of the park, the number of acres, uh, maybe even some comments about how we're going to acquire that land. And I know we're not, we can't talk about that. I did not look in the CIP to see it was in our five-year CIP. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't think even from that aspect. So just some more comments sure. about the park because it is a major piece besides Linmar being that Correct. sector, 40 acres. That park becomes the next big piece of it that everybody's going to kind of build around. Mm -hmm. So I think that becomes another piece that the city is responsible for that becomes an integral part of how that all fits in together. So I looked at the size of it. I mean, it looked like a yeah, pretty about large. about 20 acres. How many? 20. 20. 20. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, um, um, yeah, we can we can come prepared to, dis to discuss that, okay. that part of it. Yep. Absolutely. Um, the... Uh, the next, and then the then the following one uh, F five is the setting of the is that is that item under the this portion of the let me grab my agenda setting the public hearing yeah is the school one I think it's I think it's later in the agenda but I can speak to it now no, that's right there. oh sorry number it's five. in the same section okay it's there it is five. yeah number right. five I'm sorry I just didn't um, so <coughs> item number five is setting the date for the public hearing and this is rezoning the property out off 35th Avenue to uh, to accommodate the school site in that area as well. So it's all, it's all coming together. As, as you recall, I think I mentioned at a, a previous meeting, we kind of held up um, the uh, neighborhood Indian Creek plan because we wanted to incorporate the school project into that so we could talk about it all at once and not have a, this piecemeal plan and then notifying residents all at different times about the different components of what's going on out there. So we'll be talking about all those items. They are separate public hearings because they are separate actionable items and we don't want to tie one up with the rest of them. So there'll be a number of public hearings. It might be confusing for those that are in attendance, but I think it's critical that we do it that way so that if there are some, you know, if there's something that doesn't go through that we're not throwing everything out for one item. So anyway. 
and we'll do a further presentation on the, at the work session on those documents. Um, we're actually going to have uh, RDG, the consultants that uh, helped prepare the Neighborhood Indian Creek Plan, both the first time and, this, uh, and the rewrite at the meeting to, to present. Uh, they were at the Planning Commission meeting. They did a ni very nice job of walking through it. Probably took them 20 minutes to walk through it. Um, uh, so you're aware there's a little bit of time on this, but it is a lengthy document. Um, Councilman Jensen was there, and I think he could attest that they did a pretty nice job with that walkthrough. So. Thank you. Okay, on to the next uh, agenda section, and for this I will turn over the gavel to Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this will be uh, the consent agenda for Mayor Abulasi's abstention, so we're uh, moving on to um, the administration services. There's nothing marked. Public services. Is there any discussion or questions there? Seeing none, we will move on. Uh, we'll go straight to parks. Mike, this is your show. Good afternoon. Uh, item under uh, parks that we had um, starred uh, is uh, basically a motion to approve the project calendar uh, for the Lyle Park uh, Maintenance Facility Addition um, Project. Uh, this is a project that uh, is in identified in our CIP. It's budgeted at uh, $370,000. Uh, uh, we have an uh, estimate for the project uh, right now at $348,495. Uh, I do want to note that the Parks Board has uh, reviewed the, the plans for this addition uh, and they have approved those as presented. Um, I did uh, uh, provide the council in your council packet uh, uh, the notice to bidder that did provide a lot of, excuse me, uh, provided a lot of the dates uh, associated with how the uh, the project would unfold. Uh, so with that, um, I did want to show the council uh, today kind of how this addition would look. Um, again, uh, this is black and white and, and stripes, but it would be the same color palette uh, of the existing building with the Wayne's coating at the bottom. Uh, and then so you'd have that two-toned out. So you can see this is the existing building here. Uh, this would be the south exposure. Um, let me move this up and over a little bit. Uh, that would be the, uh, the east side elevation to the, to the bottom left. And then uh, to the other side, um, we would have the west side of the building which would be facing more towards the what we consider the uh, the football field um, and the and the uh, sports uh, ball field complex down below so that would be that west side uh, exposure um, the next thing that i kind of the site uh, plan i did want to review this with council a little bit because i know that i had uh, at a previous council meeting um, I had talked about how that would impact uh, the current uh, service road to the facility, and I thought we were going to miss that. Uh, I was mistaken. We are not. So I wanted to just go through that a little bit. The yellow highlights uh, what is that existing service road to the facility. Um, So this is the yellow on the bottom then is that existing service road that goes over to the larger parking lot to the to the east. Uh, looking at this and where the, the existing road is now, we'll have to uh, come up with some, uh, some way that we route either down around to the bottom uh, to make that connection. Again, it's a service road, but for years everyone has also used it as, as a walking trail. So we still, and everyone likes those loop systems, so we'll try to, uh, within uh, uh, the grading uh, portion of that uh, with our staff, we'll figure out a plan to reroute that um, existing service road or trail um, on the top or to the north. 
Over here, this is basically where the uh, street is currently stubbed out from the larger 200 stall parking lot. So we'll grade uh, the road up to the building and possibly we will go and one of the things I thought about, we would come over and, and connect in over here to that existing service road in this phase of the project. Um, there also, I'm gonna flip this back. Also as part of, as we would extend up with the permanent roadway, there is a, we're calling out an eight foot side path over here. I'm not exactly sure if the budget will allow for that depending on how the bids come in in this phase. Uh, there's also the possibility that we could swing over and connect the trail in over here too. Because when we do another section of this development or the west end development, this, would con this roadway would end up continuing all the way up between the peewee uh, ball fields uh, and the football field and there's another parking lot that's proposed up there uh, at that time. So that's kind of how the site plan lays out for, um, for that. So we'll figure out a way to accommodate to, to, to make that connection of the, of the trail because I know it's very popular and, and we'll definitely take that into consideration. Does anybody have any uh, questions uh, associated with uh, design uh, of the building? Again, this is uh, your basic uh, pole building type of structure. The existing is pole building type. Uh, this addition will also be a pole building type. It is, um, it will have uh, uh, the interior of the building will be wrapped in steel. Also, it'll have, you know, it has floor, everything else, heating, and everything associated with the project. Uh, but more, uh, re really the uh, intent of this is uh, for storage of our forestry equipment and our larger bucket truck. Any questions? Yes, sir, Mr. Brandt. Have you thought of, or maybe, maybe it's in this plan, um, but that's a lot of steel building that's in the middle, smack dab in the middle of the park. We thought of trees, shrubberies around it to kind of yeah, hide it from everybody, everything else, just so it's not Very an similar to what we've done with the existing building and there's shrubbery that's planted around that and we've uh, tried to do, use that natural screening whenever possible uh, well and we'll continue to do, do that. One thing that uh, we actually started uh, last year over a year ago with anticipation that we were going to do this on the south side of the pond. Uh, we actually planted uh, a couple hundred uh, seedlings there uh, and eventually those will grow up. That's gonna help us with, there already is the wood lot there that helps to screen this to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also on the, on the east side, we've done planting over there too. So yes, we'll continue to do that natural landscaping to help just kind of make that fit in uh, to the park setting as much as we can. Okay, thanks. Ms. Kedalia. Will you um, continue that, I, can't, I don't know what it's called, but it is like that car gate so that non-public service vehicles can, because that concerns me now with the new um, playground that's coming, that just that people don't think that it's for their use, it's really just internal. So yeah, well, that. We'll, we will have to, wherever we stub out, we will need to continue to restrict that traffic through the, through the park. Otherwise, you know, whatever connection we make, once we, uh, we would make a through road over to the school, and we just cannot allow for that to happen. And so, um, and you know, what we'd really like to do is really get the foot traffic away from going around the front of uh, this facility mm -hmm. is really the intent uh, to someday get to where we're going more over around the pond and through the wooded area uh, for pedestrian traffic uh, the trail users than walking in front of a, a maintenance facility. So yes, we will make that sure that sense. we're restricting uh, who's allowed in that area. Okay, thank you. Yep. <coughs> Any other questions for Mike? No? Okay, thank you, sir. Yep, thank you. Moving on through, uh, there's an item on uh, engineering. Are there any additional questions before we move on to the regular agenda? Seeing none, I'll uh, relinquish the meeting back over to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, under regular agenda administrative services, we have a number of items uh, stored. Who's, who's handling these? Items three through eight are in regards to the upcoming bond issuance that we have. Um, we initially set the public hearing for Thursday, and that is what we are going to be doing. We're going to be holding public hearings and then taking additional action as required by Iowa Code. That's going to allow us to enter into loan agreements. It's the authorization. So we're just kind of following the legal process. I did include the schedule that shows that we are going to be needing to take several additional actions. Um, April 4th, we'll be setting the date of sale for April 18th. April 18th, then at City Council, we will be accepting the winning bids. And then on May 9th, we adopt the authorizing resolution for the bond issuances. So really quickly, I just wanted to go over what each of the series were. There's three series, 2019A, 2019B, and 2019C. 2019A has an estimated par value of $5,430,000 and a maturity date of June 1, 2037. This is our standard new money issuance, so this will be supported by the debt service levy, and I did include a number of the uh, listing of the projects to you. I can go over them if you'd like by public hearing here. I do plan on having a PowerPoint presentation available for the public hearings so that the citizens can view them. 2019B has an estimated par value of 3,365,000. This one will be supported by tax increment finance and will be subject to annual appropriation. So this will be paid out of the Collins Road Urban Renewal District. And then 2019C is the refunding. So we are refunding the 2013A issuance that we had done years ago for the new police station facility. And Tiana has estimated that we'll have approximately $500,000 in savings with the refunding. What, I didn't know if you guys have questions. Like I said, I do have a PowerPoint presentation put together for Thursday so that citizens will be able to view exactly which projects we're talking about, and I did provide a detailed memo. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a quick one. Um, Leanne, the original maturity date on those were 6-1-2037 on the bonds that were issued for the PD? Yes. So, and you said what was the savings? How much? She was estimating it was like 497000 and change. Four ninety seven. And okay. it's obviously just an estimate at this point. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Engineering. Sorry for my crackling, sick voice, but I'm almost over the cold. <coughs> All right, so item number one is the MOA with Rookwood Estates. Um, the developer has come and agreed to put those two 60-foot sections of property in um, that are kind of no man's land. We had talked about this previously when you guys gave us direction to do it. Um, talking with legal, we're not sure that we would be able to get all of those funds if we did a special assessment because it's fixed on the amount of value that the land is worth. And since there's no building there, that decreases the amount of land. There could be some other avenues that we go down as far as liens or ways to get it so I'm not saying we're not going to be able to get that money but police and fire can speak or public service not putting that connection in is going to cost us more than that $20,000 by having to go around um, so it's a no-brainer to us to go ahead and put that in and then we'll work with legal with what we can with legislation has left us um, to recoup what we can I just want to make sure it was clear that we may not be able to recoup all of it. And you said it's twenty thousand. So yeah, it's estimated at twenty thousand four hundred, two hundred forty. And right now, right now, you said you can recover about fourteen thousand of that for certain. The rest of it is best effort. Yeah, that's if we do a special assessment right. you know, through that procedure. Okay. But there's opportunity costs there that we would be losing if we didn't put it in right. at all. Okay. 
Everyone clear on that? All right. Number two. So item number two is just giving us proceeding to move forward with those sidewalk recommendations that Jake gave you the presentation on uh, the last council meeting. And so this is the preliminary project calendar, pushing that forward. Once this approved, then we will start the assessment process. The property owners will be getting certified letters. Um, there'll be a public hearing that's set, and that'll be the next meeting that you have that is when the public actually has the opportunity to come and present to council whether they're for or against the sidewalk. Next. Next one we have we'll have a public hearing on Thursday and then we actually did receive six bids for our sanitary sewer maintenance project. Um, so the you got in a detailed bid tab that's in your council packet. This is just kind of a summary. So the low bid was from Rachi Construction at 75% of the engineer's estimate, which was 137,745. Um, this is removing and replacing nine sanitary manholes, adding one new sanitary manhole two sanitary sewer point repairs with work starting no later than 7 22 19 40 working days $300 per day in liquidated damages okay very, very clear on that next one is our project calendar for our pedestrian beacon project so if you guys remember last year when we were bidding the Grantwood Trail, we originally had those beacons in there, and they filed for a patent, which then took it out of the MUTCD. Um, they have withdrawn their patent, so we can now put rapid flashing beacons in. So um, we, th we were able to throw this plan set of plans together very quickly because we already had them done. Um, and so it's putting those rapid flashing beacons in along the Grantwood Trail that is now finished. Great. So I'll we'll have a, an engineer's estimate of $90,700, a letting date of 4-9-19 with a late start date of 7-8-19, which could be pushed depending on how long it takes to get the materials, and then 30 working days to install it, and $300 per day in liquidated damages. I was wondering about the liquidated damages. I mean, do we, are there situations where we actually collect those? I assume so. Absolutely. Yeah. And what happens to the money? Um, we just receive it back into the CIP funds. I love those funds. <laughs> I mean, generally, if it's three hundred dollars per day, it's going to be hard for it to actually make an impact on a ninety thousand dollar project. But but some of them are higher than three hundred. Yeah, I mean, they get up to fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions on that item? Dave, next. Next is an MOA with uh, the developer of uh, Squaw Creek. So basically, we got the grant to put the signal in at uh, Hennessy and 13. Um, anything above that grant or that is considered non-participating, the developer is going to pay for. So he's paid for the engineering plans. Um, he's helped us negotiate the easements that you guys will approve on Thursday. Um, any improvements that are considered non-participating. So something like putting drain tile along Hennessy, that's a private street. The DOT sees that as non-participating. That drain tile does not need to be installed in order for the traffic signals to work. So they'll determine what's participating and what's non-participating. So everything that's non-participating or is above the $500,000, the developer's gonna pay for. So that's just that MOA. We'll front the money and then they'll just have to cut us a check at the end. Okay. And then is the project calendar for the actual signal project. <clears throat> so this is actually adding the signal at Hennessy and Highway 13 adding turn lanes for northbound and southbound traffic so that you can turn into culvers or turn the quick trip. The engineer's estimate is 588,000. 
the letting is 43019. The late start date is 7819 with 50 working days. Liquidated damages of that's not right. It's higher than a thousand dollars per day. Um, this is one that there's a possibility that they might get the churn lanes in and install stop signs on the churn lanes, and we might have to sit and wait for the hardware. I believe Ryan's signal that he ordered was 22 weeks at that time, and who knows how late we have to wait because of that. But that signal hardware takes a long time to get there with the tariffs and everything that's going on. So it could be that they make a lot of the ground improvements and then the signals were just sitting and waiting. And that's not the contractor's fault, but um, so the sooner we can get this bid and ordered, the better. But just so you guys know, if you get phone calls on it, that's likely what's going to occur. Go ahead. Mike, on this one here, I just want to make sure I'm just for the clarity um, for the public. This is affecting obviously the traffic flow on Highway 13 north southbound, right? Mm -hmm. Do we see uh, what will the anticipated changes then be with the speed limit from the northbound side? Do you will yeah, that be no. re does that have to be reassessed? Will that be pushed out further to the north as far as a reduction? Obviously, there's no proposed change in the speed limit. They did have to look at the vertical sight distance to determine how long the all red should be so that someone doesn't run the light. Um, there has been a request previously for us to contact the DOT and work on lowering the speed limit to the north, and that is on my to-do list. I was just I know there's been some con conversation, some questions about that, and you know, I keep thinking of that one down on Mount Vernon Road, you know, <laughs> and, and that one as well, too. Obviously, the speed going through there extremely fast, and changes to the light signals and so forth. So I just wanted it for the public record. I appreciate that. Thanks. There is a sign that is out there right now. It's for 13 and 151 that has the flasher that says signal ahead. That will be reused and pushed farther to the north. So okay. at least they will have some notification that that's there. Perfect. I, I just know with the rolling hills right there, it was a huge concern for a couple of people I've been talking to. So thank you. Yes. So my one quick question, I'm, I think I know the answer, but is this new one, new, new traffic <coughs> light automatically synced to the one at 13 and 151? Mm. I mean, I'm looking at the speed limit as everybody else is talking about, and as they're coming through there, I'm assuming that's automatically synced in a way to progress the traffic through there smoothly? Yeah, so the, the traffic signal is called a fully actuated, so there's little cameras on it that detect when cars to change. And there's some minimum times and maximum times for red and clear um, timing. But then it's also connected with our fiber to all the other signals. And Ryan has a command center that he can actually communicate them together. So it's not necessarily, so it's not going to operate on its own. I really see it as being more key connecting, connecting to the traffic flow pattern coming through Highway 13 mm -hmm. going north and south yeah, rather than cross traffic. Yeah, the problem is you can only coordinate in one direction at a time. Okay. So, for example, the Lynn Air traffic signal can't be coordinated at the same time as the Walmart one on 7th Avenue. So you have to kind of, and so there's some timing and stuff that we'll work with them. All right. All right. Okay. Anything else on that one? All right. Is that it for you, Mike? Okay, community development. So the <clears throat> first item under community development is an IDO review and a central quarter IDO review for uh, the property located on the west side of the uh, 27th Street roundabout. Um, between the roundabout and Lebeda. I think everybody's pretty aware of the location. Tom, um, ex Tom excuse me one second. I've turned over the gavel to oh, Mayor Potemis. Pardon me. Just wanted to note that. Thanks. So as the council's uh, very aware of the IDO process, um, this is an opportunity for the city staff to review this uh, project against the interim development review ordinance and then the planning commission and ultimately the city council uh, would approve of this before it moves forward. Um, this, this is the site. You can see the 
the, I guess the nose of the roundabout in this vicinity, Lebeda here. It's a multi-tenant building um, with access onto 6th Avenue at the predetermined uh, location uh, by engineering when we set the uh, corridor uh, management plan along uh, 6th Ave. Um, you've got uh, four tenant space. The corner space is uh, First Federal Credit Union. And they're the ones that are really driving the project. If you've been to the, um, we're near Westdale, I believe this is a very similar uh, setup as they have in that location. Um, so there's, uh, they're showing a coffee tenant. I think that's just primarily they're marketing it for uh, a drive-through uh, situation. Um, dumpster locations, they got some permeable pavers. It's a tight site. Um, you can see there is a, uh, there is a one-way uh, circulation through the site. Um, and it generally lays out towards the roundabout. Um, and it's consistent with the, the uh, layout as the properties on the, on the east side of the roundabout as well. You'll see when we bring forward the corridor design standards, the, the further down we go towards uptown, we'll be pushing those buildings <coughs> up towards 7th Avenue and not wanting to see uh, that parking directly in front of the buildings. And we'll be uh, adding also that uh, drive-throughs would be more of a conditional use because we're trying to make that area more walkable and pedestrian friendly. So the elevations. Um, this just lays out the material list, and, and you guys have received this in your packet. Um, if you have questions on this particular and this percentages, let me know. I think what most people look at are these, and these are the 3D renderings of the site uh, as it sits on the property. Um, and you can see um, this is the southwest perspective. So looking uh, north, um, you would see the corner facility. Uh, they got a little bit of a angled uh, roof line with some third story windows at the top. Um, and this is the southeast proposal. Sorry. I got the varying colors and material listings. There's quite a bit of glass. I'd say that from a building perspective, they've, they've built the facility um, with somewhat of a, a front door on each side. Obviously, there's always got to be some service, and this, this site doesn't lend itself well to having um, a way to hide the service because it's got a major arteri or an arterial roadway on three sides. Um, so it is a little bit difficult, but there's been some screening elements that are kind of put in place to kind of hide some of the service entries in, the, in what you might consider the back end of the business. And then this is the uh, north side of the building, and this is where you see there's, there's some windows being proposed, but the service entries in <laughs> the window are certainly not the greatest, but you know, like I said, it, when you build a building, you've got to have a back end, and this is this is where they're they're, they're identifying that to be located. Um, mixed materials variation in the elevations, as well as the uh, um, footprint as well. So you got some corners and some um, uh, setbacks into the uh, facade that kind of breaks up that flat, long plane of a of a building. So this was reviewed by the planning commission. Um, and recommended for approval, and uh, it's to the city council for review at this point. Do you have any questions on it? That you think the council received all of what you said? Yes. House parking? Do they um, are they getting exceptions on the parking? It looks pretty tight, and that one way concerns <coughs> me. Just from like when I think about Dunkin' Donuts, <coughs> the debacle that that can be on weekends with the one one way, and then you know with Seventh being. A pretty major thoroughfare and because we're not doing Albernet for a while it gets pretty busy right there and cars are waiting to turn and I just don't want to create the situation with the higher speed even coming into the roundabout so did we give them exceptions on the parking or is this really meeting for businesses standards um, I will I will verify it but I'm fairly certain that that was a tight parking plan but I don't believe there's many there's not there's not been a variance request okay so, so they are they are meeting the standard um, one of the reasons you're seeing the angled parking is to get the appropriate parking. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I will verify that before okay. Thursday, but that's that's kind of where they're sitting. Um, it is tight. Um, the concern we raised <coughs> with them as well was that part, was the drive-through situation. Yeah. And the stacking, you can see that we've got a curve. The idea is that the stacking would wrap on the private property. It can't, we won't. 
stacking in this vicinity on 7th Avenue just wouldn't be. But that's assuming if you're coming off of 7th headed east and you want to do the drive through, you've got to go through that whole shebang, right? Yep, to absolutely. get back. Or you can not pay attention and kind of come in at an angle and cut off everybody trying to get out and stack on 7. Mm -hmm. That's that, what I see happening. Yeah, and that, so. that will be something that, you know, will be a an issue that we'll yeah. have to deal with from a... That'll be cheap. We'll call the chief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Free coffee for life, I bet, if you could make this work. <laughs> Solve that problem. Okay. So, yeah, and that is what we what we generally see, and I think, I, I, I don't know if it's a great example, because they still have stacking at Dunkin' Donuts. Mm -hmm. I always call it Donut Land. But they always have stacking out there on the weekends specifically. But you know, some of the, to some degree, you're 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 kind of thinking that as the newness of something like that wears off, that that would uh, kind of dissipate because um, if you when you get there, there's a fine line between ensuring that you have enough stacking and then how big the site is, mm -hmm. and so. But I that is it's a bad situation, and and that I don't think we would be able to. Um, accommodate kind of like we do on 7th Street or whatever it is on 9th, uh, yeah, 9th. on 7th Ave I mean with the with the street classification kind of reminds me of the it would remind me of a situation similar to like a, in Northland Avenue when the car wash uh, went, I, you know it's a situation where on a beautiful day in the spring it backs way up but most of the time it's fine and that's just that's a that's a tough one to accommodate Okay. I guess I want to chime in on that one as well too because I this is exactly how the Starbucks is set up on the southwest side on Williams Boulevard. Terrible. And when the cars are parked there on the northbound side, if you take a look at that, they're stacked up at a right angle and then that traffic comes in, you you block all those cars in and it, it was it's a mess. It was a mess again last weekend. Huh. And then the because that's only a, that's only big enough to get a car through there in one lane. So when that's stacked up all the way back around yep. now all those people are stuck inside there trying to get out the other thing too is is that drive through if there's not a physical wall there there will be people trying they will be sitting on 7th avenue with their turn signal on waiting to get in there mm -hmm. uh, that is guaranteed i work at the corner of our dunkin donuts on 7th 8th avenue and 6th street and inevitably every friday morning they are backed up and around the corner there until somebody just gets agitated enough so it it is something that i think i mean it's that's their deal but i mean we can't burn any burden on seventh avenue's traffic yeah. flow i think that's a terrible traffic flow yeah, we set up the way that is but i guess that's none of our business but well we've we've certainly brought that concern forward um again too um, especially with that being parallel right next to that hotel those those in out those in and outs there are going to be horrendous on a Saturday morning, yeah. um, especially when they're trying to get to a ball game, right? I, th I think that maybe some of the concerns to mention, you know, <coughs> so there'll be this will be on the agenda for review. I think that's a, a question for the for the developer as well, um, and and I mean this is a review process, so that ability to voice a concern and say, hey, we have a real problem with the drive-through on that is that's within the council's purview to say. Because we brought it up at the very beginning as well, saying it's a tight site. Well, and two, I mean, it's just you know because of my my uh, my emergency background. Oops, excuse me. My emergency background is there is no way an ambulance is going to get through that area there. They will be locked out of that until the traffic flows cleared out. So it, I don't know. I yep. they tried to they tried to maximize that space. They for sure, but I got a lot of concerns with it personally. Yep. One more quick thing. Yep. They, um, the drive-through, is that permitted already or is that something that they're asking for variance? It, it would be permitted, uh -huh. but it's also got a function. And so that, I mean, it, it, through this uh, IDO process, I mean, that could be something that it's like, you know, we see a limiting factor here. So they're just. Yeah, I, I, right now, I'm, I, I don't know. Something's got to change for me to feel good about that because it's. I agree that Starbucks on the over by Westdale does that and you don't even want to park back there because you know you're going to get jammed in there, you know, if it's busy. But okay. Thank you. I know that's for Mr. Them. Jensen. I mean, I understand the the 
the, the first federal credit union is kind of a the, the anchor. That's what's driving the project. This entire building. Uh, first of all, I, I do find it, the one part I do like about this is that it, the front entrance to it is on 6th Avenue. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of our first entrance, giving something there. So whatever they can do on the 7th Avenue side to make that look better is certainly going to be appreciated since that's also uh, a travel route. But they do have a lot of trees and shrubs and greenery, uh, I know, on this to kind of break that up. But from the standpoint, I agree with them. Uh, you know, you're, you got a drive-through for federal for the credit union, and then you got the drive-through for the potential coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And I know they're not. You know, that's just what they're showing as a possibility. So if they put it, whatever shop they have there, if you eliminate the drive-through on that, mm -hmm. you know, that opens the whole piece up. Because if I'm one of these other tenants, tenant A or tenant B, and even the credit union, and my customers get jammed up all the time, they're going to quit coming in there. So I think they really need to think, really think about having a drive through on both sides mm -hmm. of this building on a one-way uh, one parking lot. So I, I, I'd be apt not to approve it with, to, to, with, with the traffic patterns potentially in the parking lot and on 7th Avenue. The 7th Avenue bothers me more yeah. than the parking lot. I mean, the, the business people can decide what they want to accept. Mm -hmm. But I'd be more concerned about cars sitting on 7th Avenue when that's the lane everybody needs to go through the roundabout, yeah. and that's where all the traffic's going to go. So I'd be more concerned about that 7th Avenue issue than I would the parking lot issue itself. Yep. So. Any other questions for Tom? No? Okay, so that takes care. Is that both of those then, Tom? Uh, no. The next uh, one. Yep. Sorry. Go, go ahead. Nope. That's your convenience. Um, the next item on the other side of the street, just on the <laughs> west side of the roundabout, um, we've got a uh, really at this point it's more of a discussion item and some action that's necessary to make to ensure that a project can move forward on that site. And then that project, this project will also have a full review as well. Now. Um, I did share with you the elevations uh, of the of the proposal. That has not been a full through a full review at this point, and I'll just let you know that there are some concerns that we've seen with the building, and we'll be asking for some adjustments to be made. Um, uh, this is the site. So, building. This is the the Marriott Seventh Avenue roundabout. Uh, 27th Street would be extended to the south. Um, if you recall, uh, in, when you drive through there, there's no extension of 27th Street. And that was primarily, we didn't know where it was going to go. We didn't have an alignment set. At the Early on, there was a proposal that we would have a street that would run the back side of this entire development and extend over to 31st Street, potentially. Um, and that's been some time ago when that plan was actually in place. As that project has uh, come together and we've worked with the developer, the city sold ground, um, bought ground, sold ground out in this area in multiple different ways and times. Um, what we've done is ensured that that access along that south portion of the property is, is uh, maintained, but it's maintained on a uh, public access easement. So uh, there is a permanent public access easement provided on the south side of that property as well as a trail easement that goes between the development and the, and the property to the south. And the city's participating in some of that construction um, uh, or participating in the cost to construct that trail in that area. Um, so the projects come in, um, and as you've seen in your, oh, it's a multi-tenant building with a drive-through. Um, you can see that this one has a very large drive lane being proposed as a part of it as well. Obviously, there's more room to accommodate it. Um, and again, I think there's, that's still being, that's still being reverted internally. This is just more of a preliminary uh, layout. What the developers are asking as a part of this project is that this, this area that's highlighted in yellow, um, that is currently owned by the city as a part of this project, or it's owned by the city because that's where there was consideration for a street to come along and go to the south. You can see that a large portion of the property is occupied by a public access easement in this north piece and then along the south side. Really, it's just one row of parking 
that uh, would be private development on that site. The rest of it's, for the most part, uh, uh, public access easement or trail easement. Uh, as a part of this project and as a, as a, I guess, basically as an overall a request to the city, they're requesting that um, this property be uh, provided to them as a part of the project and that um, 27th Street uh, improvements would be, ma they would make 27th Street improvements and have those reimbursed to them by the city. So they would make the, make the improvements and then we'd reimburse. Um, the improvements to 27th Street, um, I think it, the city's uh, staff supportive of that. Um, 22nd Street South to 5th Avenue, the city's gonna be putting in and the Central Corridor, we've, we've done all of those improvements and have not required the development community to, to participate in those projects. So, uh, and it also would, uh, would be completed by the developer and we wouldn't have any city uh, work being done on that and then we would accept it, approve the plans and accept the project. So a couple items on the agenda uh, would be uh, directing staff to proceed with preparing a plat of survey, starting down the road of disposing of public property, and then also negotiating a development agreement uh, for the improvements to 27th Street. So those are the things that are being contemplated with the project. Um, it does clean up the area. It would, it would complete the development between the roundabout and uh, the Marriott and kind of clean that area all up. So. This was, it's really a request of the developer to move the project forward. And they do have one anchor tenant that they're uh, not saying at this point um, publicly that would, that's bringing the project forward and causing us to, to move in the direction. So uh, this wouldn't be just uh, because they want to do it, they got a project that's driving it. And the illustrations as indicated would be the review process that we'd be going through um, and those were submitted on behalf of the developer. So, any questions on that? Mr. Jensen. Yeah, could you clarify for me why it would be appropriate that they would not bear any cost for 27th Street down to the south end of where the lot would be well, acquired? Well, in, in, this, in this area, on, along the corridor, we have not been, uh, requiring the developers to do uh, or make the public improvements associated with the projects. Uh, I'm not saying we'd want to do this throughout the corridor, but okay. 22nd Street's another area where we're like in front of the multifamily housing project. We're gonna extend 22nd Street between 6th and down to 5th on property we own and the city's going to front those costs. So uh, that would be consistent with every, all the other streets that we put in in this in area around associated the, with with the roundabout the, and the other improvements. Yep. Right. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions, Ms. Fidelia? Yeah. Um, so why wouldn't we want them to pay for that? Well, it's not I don't just them, but like in general, from a um, philosophical standpoint, why wouldn't we want the developers? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's that we don't want it. But we'd love for them to yeah, pay for it. Yeah, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> um, it's it's really it's part of the redevelopment. Um, it all comes down to the cost. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's cost to do it and the development of the project in the area. Um, we've been working kind of in partnership on a lot of this area because this is the old Marion Iron site. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's been kind of the philosophy in this area is, you know, the, the remnant parcel is, will be remnant. I mean, we could also think about the, the acquisition of that. I think there's a lot of, um, that would be a difficult value to establish. So I don't know that that necessarily is something we'd want to look at, but I mean, that's. So it's been to spawn economic development. Correct, yeah. Okay. It's, all, it's all been kind of contemplated as part of, uh, part of an overall incentive to get the project going. That's, that's the proposal coming in from the developer. Okay, yep. and so um, to this specific piece in yellow right here, why wouldn't we sell that? And that, just what I was saying, that it, it is a remnant piece. Um, it is occupied by, a lot of public access easements and such. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're really gaining, I don't know, eight spots from, from that piece. And a driveway. Um, what's that? And a driveway. And, and access. <laughs> the, the alternative is, and, and believe me, I, if there's a desire to move in that direction, that's, that's fine. The, the developers would like to see it gifted to them, obviously, as part mm -hmm. of the incentive package. But the, the development would look substantially different. Um, just by virtue of that land not being a part of it. Um, they, could, they could accommodate it, the development, 
they would actually readjust it, obviously. Yeah. It does clean it up, makes it a nicer corner. So um, is this where we, if we were to charge for this, is this like the 130%? Maybe I'm thinking of the right away figure, but yeah. to me, that wouldn't be super expensive anyway. Like, I don't feel like we charge perhaps maybe what I would like to charge, although that's not my background. So in my mind, I'm like, we should be getting a lot of money for this. Um, I would like to see what the comp is that they would be taking on to improve the street versus selling the land. Sure. I'd almost rather have it just be a clean, mm -hmm. sell it to them, and then we still do the street, or or something yep. where we're actually looking at numbers to decide if this is a good deal for the city. Yep. I, me personally, but I d I'm I'm not for gifting the land without seeing those specific figures sure. on the trade off. That. Yep. That's just me. I kind of, uh, at the same time too, I, I was around in 16 when we had those conversations when we were dealing with what land value was and the minute we turned around and, and moved it over, it all of a sudden had a popped up value and so I, I remember those mm -hmm. and also to the easements that went through for 7th Avenue as well too. So I'm, I'm kind of in the same vein of wanting to see what things are penciling out here a little <laughs> bit. I appreciate what they're wanting to do and, and mm -hmm. all the projects they're putting uh, before us here too, but again too being the... Mm -hmm. I guess being the the holders here for the community, I, I would like to see that. Yeah. I would like to see that. Yeah. Agreed. Mr. Brent. Have we, the rest of the development all on there over to 31st, we have not given them any of the land. We've sold them land. Yeah, but yeah that was all. From, uh, yep. Yeah, so I don't know why we would yeah. just give them this part when we've sold the rest of the other little parcels mm -hmm. and chunks off to them. That'd be my two cents on that too. Is mm -hmm. yeah, my my two cents is they'll buy the piece. Yeah, because the okay, price is going to be reasonable. They'll buy the piece because it makes cheap. the project work. It's right, and, it's and we're putting in 27th, so the city is making an investment. Yeah. So, so, so w with that statement, or is with 27th Street, or is it the city would put this 27th Street in? Is that what the? Okay. Is that what you're proposing? Yeah, they're asking that the city put it in. Yeah, I just want to make yeah. sure that that's But they're right. talking about us doing, gift, gifting in the land and putting in 27. Correct. And yep. I'm going, yeah, I don't yeah. agree to both of those. Yeah, they would put it in and then we would reimburse them for that's the That's fine. That part I'm fine with. But okay. Sure. Understanding what we've done in the past, but no, I, I'm not in favor of gifting I just wanted to be able to have the piece of land. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. That's why we wanted to put it on for... A discussion item before we get too far down the road so excellent thanks Tom no yep. other questions I'm going to relinquish the meeting back over to the mayor anything else anything else on the um, community development section it's not starred anyone wants to discuss otherwise we'll move on to city manager Thank you, Your Honor. The first item up for discussion on, under uh, the city manager's section is the uh, resolution adopting a revenue purpose statement uh, that would govern the use of revenues that the city could potentially receive from uh, franchise fees on gas and electric bills. Uh, as the council will remember, the budget for FY20 calls for the city to enact franchise fees of 4% on gas and electric bills. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> There's a lot of pieces that come with that. <laughs> and uh, it all springs from the revenue purpose statement. With the revenue purpose statement, what we are doing is announcing to the world what we would intend to use the revenues from franchise fees for. So uh, what I have highlighted here in yellow is essentially the laundry list of things that uh, franchise fees can legally be used for. And you can see that they have uh, quite a few different potential uses. For purposes of the state, when they define public safety, that includes fire, police, emergency services, but also sanitation, street, and civil defense departments. Civil defense, in our case, might be particularly important because I'm not sure how many of the council members really realize it, but as Marion has continued to develop further to the east and as we get to the north, we are getting out of the territory where Dwayne Arnold has financial responsibility for the civil defense siren system. So as Marion continues to get out into those areas, that's a cost that we end up having to assume locally. And... Um, 
We've talked in the past about uh, potentially <coughs> including not only public safety for a purpose in there, but also property tax relief. One of the wrinkles that legal uncovered on the property tax relief side is that if we do put a statement in there that we're going to use it for that, we have to specify the percentage, which in turn becomes something that you end up having to track during the whole duration of the franchise fee. So at this point, I would recommend that we would not include that as part of the legal uses. Um, you can either uh, Pair the list down now to what you feel is appropriate to announce to the public that we're going to use the dollars for, or you can do it after the hearing and as we move through the process, because adopting the ordinances, uh, like every other ordinance, does take three readings, so you would have more opportunities to review this and change it, but it's at council's discretion which way you would move forward with it. I would add that there are a few other purposes that I did not include, which include um, the repair, reconstruction, improvement, cleanup of existing public improvements and other, other publicly owned property buildings and facilities. And then there are ones that are less common too. I, I don't think that's a super common one that I've seen in these. Uh, some cities do just include everything so that they're not limited at all. Um, but the other ones include like energy conservation measures for low-income homeowners and low-income energy <coughs> assistance programs and weatherization programs um, and let's see here uh, disaster relief type things and property tax abatements building permit fee abatements and abatements for other fees for property damaged by a disaster those are two separate ones you get the disaster relief projects and the property abatement and then there's uh, economic development activities and projects. And then um, there's some other things that talk about in excess of the 5% of gross revenues, which shouldn't apply here since we're looking at 4%. So there are some other ones that I could add in if, if you so chose to do so. Um, and as Lon said, <coughs> we have this for you now, but if you wanted to wait until after a public hearing, you could do that. We are not required to have a public hearing on the, the revenue purpose statement, but we could schedule one if you wanted to do that. We do have um, resolutions for the public hearings for the specific franchise fee ordinances that will be at the next council meeting. So you will have the full text of our proposed ordinances then. Um, I could add a public hearing for this easily for Thursday if you wanted me to do that. Or if you just wanted to table this until after the public hearings, you could do that as well. One thing I am going to um, put out there is that I think any discussion about the franchise fees themselves should wait until the public hearing, partially because I think this is a matter which has a really um, big reach in that it will affect every Alliant customer, every Mid-American customer, every Lynn County REC customer in Marion. And so I don't think we should have that discussion prior to the public hearing. So on Thursday, any questions you would have about the franchise fees in general or any of the public coming in, I think we should encourage that discussion to occur at the public hearing, just in case there's information divulged there that should be at the public hearing and so that we're not missing anything later in that conversation. Okay. Go ahead. My, my initial reaction was, I mean, you, you threw everything but the kitchen sink into that definition of the possibilities. I would prefer to keep it shorter, simpler, so that the public truly understands that this can't be used for basically any intended purpose. I mean, I like our original discussion uh, to talk about using it for public safety, emergency services, which I include, would in, which I'm assuming would include 911, uh, and uh, property tax relief. I mean, those two right there are both very substantial, uh, very meaningful, I would think, to uh, the citizens so a lot of the rest of it you know should be part of our you know CIP and, uh, and other parts of the budget but those two would encompass to me keep it simple and uh, cover a really large part of our annual budget yes um, I echo Steve completely um, my question on that though is how how frequently do we put this out? So we put out the 4% franchise fee and we talked very specifically about what, what we would collect on that and that's the language I'm interested in having in there. But then um, that franchise fee until we kind of revoke it continues on, correct? Like it's put out there. So how often would we revisit that to say, okay, 
you know, next year or whatever, we're going to continue with the 4%. Now it's going to be allocated toward these things. So is this at our discretion to revisit as we adjust where we foresee spending that 4% or where we allocate it in the budget? There's a couple of different pieces with that. One is that um, when you propose the length of a franchise, it's going to be automatically tied to the length of the actual franchise agreements that you're put in place. So it can't go beyond that. Uh, with changing the revenue purpose statement, that I'm not 100% sure on. I'd have to defer to Kara to see if she's un uncovered that in her research. I haven't seen anything yet about what you do down the road, but that is something that I've got my eye out for. I just haven't dug to find that exact answer yet but I do know that as far as this procedure goes some cities adopt this after the public hearing some adopt it with everything and prior to the public hearing publish it and then amend it after the public hearing and then have to republish it um, which it seems to be actually a, a relatively common way for people to do it and then the other option is that um, they just sorry um, they either adopt it and then they just don't amend it they stick with what they did originally and that tends to be what they do if they put every purpose in to begin with um, the only thing is that before we adopt this we would have to have that percentage in there for the property tax relief I do believe that we could publish notice have a public hearing and adopt an amended um, revenue purpose statement just as we did as we could do prior to the adoption of the ordinance um, I, I would need to double check on that but I believe that is an option um, again we would have to have a public hearing and we would have to give notice then of the new revenue purpose statement to um, the Iowa Department of Revenue which we have to give them notice when we when we adopt this anyway so yeah so from me just for direction I I'm with Steve I think the more we can show the intention of what we agreed we would spend this franchise fee toward we should just limit it to that language <coughs> and you know if we have to come back and revisit this um, in a year or whenever um, and and adjust it and have another public hearing then so be it but you know governments often impose a tax for a specific reason and the tax never goes away which is the problem so I want to make sure that the four percent that we agreed to after all of our work on the budget and the labor is really allocated to those things and those things only mm -hmm. yes chief Thank you, Your Honor. I just want to add to that, by shortening the list, I do recommend you leave civil s defense on the list. And the reason is because the <coughs> nuclear plant is going to close. And at this time, all the sirens within the county and all the maintenance for those and is a cost that is bared by them. Once they close, we don't know where those costs will come from. So I really encourage you to include civil defense in that list. Mm -hmm. Other discussion? Okay. I'll echo what Renee and Steve are saying. Is that was my impression to begin with. The public safety and property tax relief is why we were doing it to begin with. So that's what I would say. And then civil defense is part of the public safety, correct? Correct. It's all, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is that the consensus? Thank you. All right. Um, three more items under city manager's section that are not starred. If anyone has questions or wants to discuss those, this is the time to do so. Otherwise, we'll move, move on to several items under other department discussions. We have a parks and recreation item. Mr. Carolyn? Yes, Your Honor. Um, I think we all can agree that it's been an awfully long winter <laughs> no. and uh, as uh, the snow starts to melt away uh, and our days start <coughs> to get longer uh, I thought it would be a great uh, uh, time to have Tony come in and uh, provide the council uh, with a recap of all the events that we had out at uh, Lao uh, last summer and then to also do a review of uh, what we're planning uh, for uh, the summer 2019. So, Tony. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, Council. For those of you that don't know me, I've, I'm Tony Ireland. I've been with the department now almost six years <laughs> coming up this summer. So one of the things when I started with the uh, Kloppenstein Amphitheater coming online was 
kind of being tasked with figuring out some programming and events. So um, we've kind of grown each year um, and kind of getting a little bit, a little bit more and a little bit more stable in how we do the things out there. It's kind of every year it's been a learning process to this point. I think we're kind of getting to that point now where we're kind of turning the corner, if you will, and kind of creating a standard of kind of what we're trying to do out there with events that we're kind of programming. Um, I will talk briefly to you a little bit about um, kind of our private events and, and rentals and stuff like that that'll kind of be included here as an overview too. So I do have a PowerPoint there if, I, if, if you want to kind of take a look at it as we walk along there. So um, this is our third full season of, of programming and hosting events. And um, what I mean by that, and if I if recall correctly, Amphitheater came online 2014, right, Mike? Um, and then we did not program, I believe, that first summer just because we weren't sure. Um, we, we wanted to make sure the site and everything was, was ready for, for use and, and heavy traffic. Um, first summer was, and the first summer after that in 2015 was more of kind of a trial. We just did, I believe it was just a couple concerts and a movie night out there. Um, so this is really our, for our third full season, if you will, is what I'm kind of referring to um, for full events, if you will, out there at the amphitheater. So um, some of the challenges we go through just as it's, well, just kind of talk about these planning with events, um, scheduling. Um, if you're aware, obviously the building out there, um, pretty hot spot for graduation parties and more and more for weddings. So um, kind of balancing the scheduling of private rentals versus public events out there. Um, entertainer scheduling too. Um, so that's getting the entertainers there, um, figuring out what works with their scheduling and the routing that making sure they're coming through the area at appropriate time. Um, that gives us kind of our best rates, if you will, on entertainers, if you're not familiar with that term. So, um, you know, if we can find someone that's kind of in the area and looking to fill fill a night of entertainment, um, we can get those at a discounted discounted rate, if you will. Um, so those are kind of some of the things. Weather, obviously, it's probably the biggest headache we get. Um, we've actually lucked out, um, for the most part, I think out of all the events we've had programmed, we've had one movie night postponed out of all the years. Um, we were able to reschedule that um, a few weeks later. Um, so we've been pretty lucky with that. Had some close calls, but um, we've been pretty fortunate with that. Um, lots of other area events, obviously, with us being close to Cedar Rapids and Hiawatha and Robbins, um, there's always stuff for people to do, so we're kind of competing for um, audience, if you will. Um, so that's always a challenge, just trying to find some unique entertainment that, that would that will bring people out. Um, and the time commitment, I mean, there's more, a lot of people that come out to the special events think it's we just make a phone call, tell someone to come on out, and the event happens. So there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff and then stuff leading up to it and then post stuff. Um, and then the, the staff and, and stuff to run them and actually uh, facilitate the events when they're happening. So um, our selection of talent, so how we've kind of <laughs> dealt that, we've done actually three different ways. So um, we've had uh, in-house where we either hear of something or someone's recommended to us, um, and we go out and make the contact um, and kind of, if you will, vet them and maybe some other venues that they've been at and see how easy they're to work with and if they've, they were, you know, had good attendance and whatnot. Um, a talent agent, um, as the amphitheaters become more and more known in the area and the region, uh, we were getting more and more, it seems like, uh, entertainment uh, agents reaching out to us, asking about them coming here, um, interested in performing. Um, and then that's kind of the same thing with the direct contact from the agent, so them calling us. Sorry, the talent agent would be, um, we, we do have a local um, entertainment agent that we work with that we were, um, venue works over in Cedar Rapids, kind of referred to us. Um, we kind of work with him. He, he travels kind of the, the Midwest region, kind of looking for talent and scouting talent. So um, he kind of gives us some um, uh, some ideas, if you will, and we kind of go with them and see what maybe would work. So those are kind of three big ways we've been kind of using and selecting talent in the area. Um, and then partnering to host events. So I'll talk about a couple of those coming up here, obviously, um, with the Freedom Festival um, would probably be our biggest one that we've, we've kind of been partnering with for the past couple of years here now. So. Um, staffing of events, um, again, this kind of goes back to the what, what it takes to actually run an event and what people don't really think about um, when you're doing it. So um, from greeting enter entertainers, the production company, you know, they're two different things. They're usually the production company's doing your sound, your lights, everything like that. So they come on and get set up first, so you're making sure everything's good for them. Then the entertainers come online, it's making sure someone's there to greet them, let them in. Um, vendors, making sure they get set up in the, in the appropriate spot, and then the other entertainment that we might have going on at that time too. So. Um, set up on top of that, porta potties, trash cans, lanterns, um, handicap parking, um, coordinated meals for the entertainers, um, setting up either a green room or a private room for the entertainers, uh, parking cars, um, crowd control. Um, our police department's kind of taking care of that for us for the for all the events out there. Um, they do a good job with it. Um, and then you got your band entertainment needs, so make sure they have enough water and drinks behind the stage, um, security and privacy. And then the cleanup after the event is always everyone's favorite. So um, mm. this was kind of a summary of our uh, past.
past this past summer now we're talking 2018 so we had two moon, what we call our moonlit movie nights um, three concerts or performances that we we booked and then our Marion Art, Arts Council does do two kind of acoustic performances each summer uh, better known as the picnic on the prairie concerts um, so with them falling under us um, we kind of work with them too to make sure all their uh, T's are crossed and I's are dotted on their contracts and whatnot. So, and the partnered events there, you see Barbecue Rendezvous um, came out to Lao uh, for the first time last year, um, had a good, good success with it. Um, Freedom Festival, Swamp Fox Festival, and then obviously our popular Sunrise Yoga and our Fall into Fitness um, that started with the Marion Blue Zones um, is still going strong too. Um, and then our private events there, that would basically be <coughs> our weddings. Um, I'll talk about numbers in a little bit here, but weddings, and we do have a, a preschool graduation that comes out and has been doing the past couple summers out at Law Park as well. So these were the last two Moonlit movies that we did. Um, we've always tried to do kind of family-friendly movies, if you will. Um, obviously, that seems to bring a little bit bigger crowd out. Um, so we did two of them there. Coco was the one I was referring to last year. That was very scheduled because of it was just cold and rainy in that night. Um, so with, the, with those, you see some of the, the costs that we incur to put those on. Um, you have the movie license itself just to show it, uh, the production um, to come out and actually you know, do the, the video and audio for it. Um, we have popcorn trucks that we come out that gives away free popcorn, face painters, balloon artists. Um, we had a musical act before that, that uh, tying in with the music theme there to the movie. Um, and then kind of a craft photo booth that we had some of our, um, our rec staff kind of man. And then Wonder was our one um, at the last, our kind of bookend of the summer, if you will, um, at the end of the summer there. So same things kind of in terms of cost and, and what you can see kind of we incur attendance there. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about all of our attendance. So, um, you know, it just kind of depends on the movie, depends on the weather, depends on what else we have going on for, for uh, movies. You know, we've had upwards of almost 1,500 for some movie nights. And as you can see there, we were kind of in that, that, 400, 500 ballpark range last year for the movie nights. Um, and we'll talk about the funding there for the hotel grant, or the hotel motel grant. So uh, these were our concerts this past year. Okay, if you were, I don't know if any of you came out and, and saw any of them, but Dog Society was a group out of the St. Louis area. Um, they're an Elton John tribute band. Um, if you came out and saw them, you probably would have thought it was Elton himself up there. Um, pretty good, pretty good uh, imitation band there. Um, Big attendance there, about 2,000 people is kind of what we were estimating. Um, you can kind of see the cost there, what, what we incurred in terms of the performer cost with the additional cost. And the additional cost is all the extra stuff on top of the talent fee there. Uh, Piano Palooza was a little bit different spin on our ever popular dueling pianos in the summer. If you haven't been to one of those, usually those are, are pretty hard to find parking, hard to find seating there. I mean, it's pretty full in the back lawn there um, if you haven't been to one. So um, about 3,000 plus is what we were kind of estimating for that. Um, and then our brulee show, if anyone came out to that one as well, that was a little bit different type of entertainment. Um, really, really neat, really cool group out of the Dakotas. Um, kind of a, a Native American storytelling with, with all the props and the headdresses and everything like that. Um, about 1,500 or so for that is what kind of we were estimating as well for that. So um, brulee, I guess I should note that brulee too is also, it's, it's a national act. They've gone overseas and performed and <laughs> tour across the country as well. So. I think that was our, our first, or I should say international act, if you will, sorry. So um, that was kind of neat to have them on board. Um, it was a little bit more um, production mm. than what um, we were used to. Um, so that was kind of a learning process too, but um, it's good to see we had a good turnout for that as well. And then these were the Picnic on the Prairies. I'll just kind of put those up there briefly. I don't, I don't, I'm not too involved with those, but those are um, the Marion Art Council plans and, and coordinates all those with um, kind of their acoustic performances. A um, little bit smaller in terms of attendance, but um, nothing wrong with that. Um, they usually do one in June, one in August, um, and as you can see, their um, their costs, their costs and their uh, attendance as well. There, barbecue rendezvous. Oops, barbecue rendezvous. Um, if you aren't, yeah, if you're not aware, obviously, it moved out to Laos for the first time last year. Um, that first Saturday in June, there, they gave me an estimated number of 3,000 plus people stopped by at some point throughout the day. Um, there's five barbecue vendors. Um, we helped, we kind of helped coordinate that in terms of planning it and layout, suit, get, get a suitable layout for them and figuring out where vendors will be. Um, so they were, it's the Marion Kiwana, Metro Kiwanis, obviously that planned that. Um, and they were, uh, they were, they were great to work with. So um, formal location, if you're not aware, was the Marion City Square. So Swamp Fox Festival, obviously we're a little bit involved in that. Um, this year we didn't look out with the weather for this one, but uh, that's kind of what we had planned. They, they did, they added a, a moonlit movie of their own, if you will, on Friday night, which happened, even though it was pretty chilly out. Um, the concert and all that stuff and the vendors were all canceled because of rain. 
Um, we still held the fireworks, and we still had bingo indoors, and some, some vendors did stick around inside as well, too. So, um, Freedom Festival, I think this is maybe our, this will be our third year, I think, working with them, I believe. Um, so they've done, they've done, a, they do a couple different things. They've done what they call their Freedom Ride, which is a bike ride starting at Lau Park. Um, I guess not so much use of the amphitheater necessarily. Um, and then they do do a uh, concert out there. Um, usually that Sunday before the 4th of July happens. Um, the, the Army Band sign winders are out there. Um, I was not able to attend that one, but I heard that place was just packed out there. So they said about 3,500 people. Um, so rivals some of our own events there um, in terms of our more popular events. Um, and they're coming out again this, uh, this year as well to do a, a concert. And here's our Sunrise Yoga Fall and Fitness. If you're not aware what these are, they're kind of our free community fitness classes, we like to call them. Started with the, uh, an idea with the, the Marion Blue Zones project. Um, we get volunteer uh, instructors that come out, lead the classes. Um, our yoga can have anywhere from uh, upwards of 120 people at some point on some Saturdays. Um, and then our Fall into Fitness is usually kind of more in that 60 to 80 range. Uh, and again, these are all free for people to come out, just try out. Um, pretty low key, but uh, we're happy with the attendance and everyone everyone seems to love it. So um, we're continuing again this summer will be our, our, our next summer of that as well. Uh, these are our other events I was talking about earlier. So we had six private weddings out at the amphitheater last summer. Um, and then we do do a preschool graduation, hand in hand daycare comes out. I think last year was their second summer of doing that. They do a three-year-old graduation and then turn over and do a four-year-old graduation too. So we get a lot of people there, a lot of grandparents there, obviously, for that. Um, so that's one of our other events there. We don't do a whole lot besides kind of give them a space, if you will, to, to uh, uh, coordinate those. And then we do do a library story time also that meets under the amphitheater canopy down there um, as the weather permits during the summer. Well, these are just some of the things that to keep in mind when we're, when we're planning events there. Um, those are kind of all the things we kind of look at when we're looking at events. <coughs> the talent fees, you know, whatever the, the entertainer thinks, thinks their value is, and then with all their riders, you know, their meals and stuff like that, hotel rooms. Uh, production fees, so that's our company that comes out, whoever does our sound and lights. Security, restrooms, advertising, hotel rooms on there again. Um, staff before, during, and after. And then the other thing, sometimes we have kids' activities before, um, food or drink for, for um, either workers or, again, the band or the production crew. I know that's probably small on screen there, but that's kind of a breakdown per event, if you will, of the, the <coughs> seven events that we were involved with. Um, so you can kind of see where, where the, where the uh, fees lie there. So obviously the talent fees there are in the green. Obviously they're usually the most heavy, um, usually followed by the production and then security. Um, so you can see the brulee one, if you notice, it's a little bit skewed there to the right. Again, that was our, our most expensive act to this um, date. Um, a lot of that had to do with them being an international act, as well as the number of just sheer members in their group. I think there was 10 or 11 of them that came with them, so um, a lot of mouths to feed, if you will, for that group. Um, but it was, it was an awesome, uh, awesome event if you were able to come out there for it. Again, that's just another breakdown, maybe, maybe a better representation, or just kind of gives you an idea of per event there, kind of where the, the expenses lied. So the big orange chunk there was a, the Brulee group, um, followed by Piano Palooza. And then the art councils are uh, the picnic on the prairies were the two smaller ones there. So, kind of give you a breakdown of the event. Um, Forty-one thousand three hundred ninety-nine dollars seventy-one cents spent on entertainment um, for these seven events here at the amphitheater last year. Um, of that majority, we, we do get a lot of support from the hotel motel funding, um, and then the city budget what we budget for to kind of cover the rest right now. Um, obviously, the private events are covered by user fees and rental fees. This kind of breaks down the funding for those events there. So almost 80% was hotel motel, um, and then another 8,700, if you will, kind of backed by, by city, city budget dollars in our, in our department there. So. <clears throat> so you can see that's the hotel motel uh, tax grant there, kind of what we were awarded. So uh, we had three, the, what we call our family entertainment, it's our kind of our concerts, the, mo the movies and the picnic on the prairie. So, um, us personally, the, for fiscal year 1819, um, we were awarded 26,000 for our entertainment nights. Moonlit movies, 4,000, and then Picnic on the Prairie for both of them, um, they were at 5,000 there. So just kind of a little breakdown. Um, there was a little another little attendance, so you can kind of see what what was the most attended there. The purple ones at the bottom are ones we were directly correlated and planning there. It's kind of our attendance. 
The orange ones are either partnered events, um, so that's your Freedom Festival, Barbecue Rendezvous, Swamp Fox, Sunrise Yoga, and all that. And the green is our uh, very top, there's a private event, so any of our rentals. Another pie chart might break it down a little bit easier for you. So um, city events there in the purple, um, partnered events in the orange, and then the uh, private rentals there in the green kind of give you a, maybe a better overview of kind of where the um, attendance is for those events. Just kind of a collage of some of the photos there, if you haven't been out there before. So there's a whole bunch of them there. We've done, done a lot of different types of entertainment here in a, in a short span. Um, that's something we kind of um, we strive to do, if you will. We like to bring different types of entertainment. We've done, we've done the hypnotist and comedy magician. We've done live band karaoke. We've done um, the brulee, which was a little bit different last year. So we're trying to get away from just your typical standard musical acts, if you will, um, and kind of re reach outside the box there. Um, these are some future things we're kind of been looking at and kicking around. Um, some some been on here longer than others. Um, so one of the, the newest things is sponsorship packages for events here, uh, fiscal year 1920. Um, that's something that we are currently working on. Um, we're kind of been working with Jessica, who you met, the city event coordinator. She's kind of helping correlate that and kind of put that together. And um, she's been a big help kind of getting that kick started. Um, the city event coordinator has been huge. Increased programming. So. I think there's some opportunity out there for some more weeknight concert series instead of just focusing on you know, your Fridays and Saturdays. Um, more additional partnered events um, and then new types of entertainment. We're always looking for new things that will bring people in beyond music and just our movie nights. Um, volunteer group, we've talked about having volunteer group to help with events um, from simple, simple as parking to just crowd control and crowd management. Um, increasing vendors, um, shuttle service for parking um, constraints. Um, obviously with our new parking lot that was put in there. Um, that's that's uh, alleviated some of that, but even still for some of our bigger events, we're, we're backing up all the way onto 10th Street and across Connection, um, and it can get a little congested there. So, And then bigger acts, um, eventually probably working towards eventually some ticketed, ticketed acts, if you will. We'll have some hoops to jump through and some, some challenges to kind of get through there if we want to get to that with um, uh, the way the facility's kind of laid out there. So, But that's kind of what we're working towards, um, and hopefully sometime in the near future here. So a preview of... Uh, 2019, this hasn't been released or anything to the public yet, so you're kind of getting a little uh, behind the scenes here. So um, our Moonlit movie date's there. We got one in May, July, and August. Um, again, we always try and show kid-friendly, family-friendly movies. Um, the Greatest Showman, uh, followed by The Wreck-It Ralph, and then How to Train Your Dragon are kind of the three movies we're going after. Um, our concerts, June 22nd, is Purple Experience. It's a group from the Twin Cities area. Um, claims to be the uh, the best Prince tribute act on the market. and. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I wish I would have had a bigger picture. It's it's pretty remarkable. Totally so, <coughs> um, the dueling pianos again. This is our Midwest dueling pianos. So we're going back to kind of the original what we've had before, and then the Johnny Rogers show. He is a gentleman out of the Chicago area, but he's had stays in Branson, Missouri, um, down there. Um, he's actually doing a two for one show for us. He's doing he does um, the history of rock and roll, um, which is kind of your 50s, 60s, 70s rock and roll, and then he's doing the um, uh, the legends of country music. So your Waylon Jennings and stuff like that too. So it's going to be kind of two shows in one night there. <laughs> two shows in one night, about, um, about <laughs> 90 minutes or so a piece. Um, so we, we feel we got a pretty good value Dang for that too. Dang so um, again, we've we've vetted these. We've worked with Midwest p p Dueling Pianos before, but Johnny Rogers and Purple Experience, you know, we've called some of the venues they've been at before um, just to kind of see how they work to work with, you know, where they were they a pain, you know, um, did they have good attendance? Obviously at those some of those venues they sell tickets for them. Um, being we're offering free entertainment, it's a little bit, a little bit different from that standpoint. But um, you know they had nothing but great things to say just about them in general, working with them and uh, the ability to draw people out. So, so that's kind of a snapshot of what to expect in 2019. And the picnic on the prairies there, um, those are for June 15th, August 17th. Marion Art Council again is planning those. Um, I didn't have their names of their performers, I guess, updated on there, but um, just can keep an eye out for that too. So. Uh, the plan is to kind of release this information once we get some, uh, hopefully, some sponsorship interest here. Um, to kind of release this information <laughs> early April, if you will. Kind of go with some promotional items and uh, posters and things like that to kind of start getting the word out. So, other than that, any questions Thanks. or comments about anything? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, that it's it's been really fun to see that kind of ramp up and, and really become. A real asset to the community in terms of quality events out there and that bring the community together and provide people with entertainment options um, I, I'm really proud of it um, 
you've done a great job. Thanks. Thank you. My question is, to what extent do you see now like coordinating or turning things over to Jessica? I mean, I, I know you said you've been working with her. Sure. Yeah, you know, um, because in the back of my mind, I always thought that the, the, there were limits to what the Parks Department could do because that's not really your core function is put on events and be event planners. And then we pushed for hiring an <coughs> events coordinator so that that could be sure. done by the events coordinator. Uh, so I, I, I mean, don't know. I, I guess if I just had to initially speak to that, I would say just with uh, the event coordinator just being part time right now, um, yeah. and getting their feet under her and trying to get some other areas of the city, if you will, the art and the alleyway and stuff kind of yeah. up and going. Um, I think that's something that'll eventually probably happen. Yeah. I would I would assume. I don't want to speak. Well, I, I get that. I can you, know, you already had things in motion for the, all this year mm -hmm. and all that stuff. True. Sure. So I'm not I'm not criticizing whatsoever. I'm just curious in my mind, you know, I, 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 to what extent will there be increasing coordination with Jessica and, and having her handle a lot of this sure. stuff so that you guys can focus on what you do. Sure. Your Honor, uh, and, and just to back up what Tony said, we are involving Jessica at this time, uh, all the contracts, those type of things. She's, she's the expert in this field, if you will. Yeah. So all the contracts, she is reviewing those uh, before uh, they're approved by the park board. So we're utilizing her for that as we uh, work towards uh, sponsorships uh, for our events. Uh, she'll uh, play a heavy part of that. Uh, the one thing that we do need to um, uh, uh, be conscientious of is the, the fact that she is uh, only a part-time employee at this time. I think as uh, time goes on and uh, we realize the benefit of that position and as we expand programming not only uh, at Lao and the amphitheater uh, but uh, in the Uptown Artway and then, and, and then ov overseeing all events across the, the city platform, I think that's where you'll see that position continually grow and increase with responsibilities. So we have to, I, I just, I guess I'll end with, we just have to be careful how much we put on that position at this time but the partnership is there and it's established between the department uh, and Jessica and we'll move forward with that. Th that's all I was looking for is that at least in the long-term vision we see that progressing that way. Okay that makes that makes perfect sense Mike. Thank you. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem. Tony you're not going anywhere man. You did an awesome <laughs> job. Thanks. There is a ton of work that goes into that and that is so exciting. I get to work next to former Mayor Kloppenstein, and I like to, we like to get our jabs in every once in a while. <laughs> and uh, so to have that uh, park out there, it is getting repetition, and there's people talking about it. You know, I've heard it, um, you know, all you got to do is bring it up and people know where it's at. I'm almost thinking we're on the edge of, you know, we pay for the entertainment. Have there been phone calls where people now would be willing to pay for that stage and have a role reversal? I know the city's not, we're not going after that, right. but you and I both know that it's out there and the questions are being asked. How are you answering those questions? Um, I mean, I think to this, this point, I don't, I don't, I can't say we've personally taken those. A lot of people, a lot of those calls that do come in are more, hey, would you like to have us out there and then pay us type thing, um, which is obviously nice for them. Um, I think, uh, I think the facility itself has, I'm just, this is just me talking. That I think it has some limitations that might scare some people away with, um, you know, securing perimeters and ticketing and stuff like that. Um, you know, if you look at the amphitheater in Cedar Rapids down there, it's got some natural barriers to kind of um, build that in and control that. I mean, it's kind of built more for that versus ours kind of in an open area. So I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm, I'm saying that that could be a, um, maybe it's something until we do it and prove that it's doable um, for it and kind of set, a, set a, uh, an example. Um, you know, that's that may be something that would follow with that. Sure. I, I have the very fortunate opportunity of sitting on the hotel uh, motel tax um, committee, and so I get to see where these allocations are going from, and it, and it is exciting because the whole concept, though, of that is obviously put that money back into the money maker, right? So sure. we're wanting to get these people from our, our outreaching communities, and, and we've already heard it. People are saying they want to come here. Um, there comes a point when, you know, free can only go so long, but yet if we can keep that mindset, that's awesome. I was at the uh, Elton John um, commemorative uh, uh, 
performance and it is ex super exciting to see motor coaches parked behind that amphitheater because you know um, uh, with those are coming those uh, bigger performers and and the crowds just keep getting bigger and bigger so um, truly um, thanks to you thanks to the parks um, it is a huge component to our city so thank you thank you I, I, I can see the uh, uh, reasoning to have some ticketed events, but I think the attractiveness of this is is that it is a community asset for free community entertainment. And as our hotel and motel funds grow with additional hotels, we'll be able to continue funding. This is the perfect use of hotel motel funds, and we'll be able to continue using uh, more funds to, to do this type of thing, I think, and offer it. I w when I lived in uh, Houston, um, there was a amphitheater at a park that any every night of the week you could go there and find something going on on that stage that was absolutely free to the public. And um, that was such a attractive asset for the community. So I, I, I really appreciate that part of it. Appreciate everything that you've done to to move it further along from just being a wedding venue. Sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> and uh, I, I know it takes a lot of work and the logistics must be just uh, uh, crazy, but uh, you've, you've done a great job. And Thank you. We, we, the, the response from the community, from the region at large has been, has been nothing but positive. So yeah, thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Gowan House. Yep. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. This was uh, asked to be placed on the agenda as a discussion item for the City Council. Uh, as the City Council knows, we uh, currently own the McGowan House. That was gifted to the city uh, as a bequest from Mildred McGowan's estate. Uh, the, she had concerns with the property that, uh, uh, that it would not necessarily get transferred into the hands of someone who could properly maintain it in its historic context and wanted to see it maintain, be maintained as an asset to the community. Uh, uh, there were some stipulations put in the agreement regarding um, the use of the property. So uh, it can't be used for high intensity commercial uses, anything like that, where you'd have a huge amount of traffic coming in and out that would cause the property to, to deteriorate. Um, however, it was also not a stipulation that the city own it forever. Um, since we've owned it, the city has made significant improvements to the property, including putting in ADA restrooms, we've put an ADA ramp in, um, we've replaced the uh, heating system system with a new high efficiency boiler, we've put in an air conditioning system, and the question was just asked about whether or not it would be something that the city would consider uh, you know, selling or moving out of city ownership. From my perspective, um, we are not really great at being landlords. And for us, you know, maintaining a house is very different than maintaining one of our facilities. So if there's a problem over there, Parks gets a call and has to send somebody over. It's taking, in my mind, people away from some of their more core tasks to make sure that we can keep the facility up and running. Um, the lease that we currently have on it is uh, done in April. And so so if there are, if the council has an interest in it, there would be some opportunities to maybe look at doing something different with that property. Um, when I think through how that would work, I think in order to make sure that we were honoring the intent of the estate, we probably would want to establish some standards for how the property had to be maintained and how it had to be used, um, whether that's through a deed restriction, uh, something that gets put under the sale agreement so that, you know, any future owners would know when they updated the abstract what the requirements were. Uh, what would have to happen with the property and how it would have to be maintained in the future. So uh, council had asked that we bring this forward. So I wanted to let kind of let you know what the background of it was and where it stands. Um, you know, we have another property that we that's commercial that we are leasing right now that I would also dearly love to not own in the future um, because it just you know as there's a private market out there for it, um, the city really shouldn't be in a position where we're competing with the private sector on those types of things. Steve. Yeah, I was the one that uh, got this put on the uh, agenda for discussion purposes. I brought up just the concept of selling the McGowan House back in 2018 with the activity we had on the uh, historic houses to the west of us that Joe Hill is working on. It made me think more about the McGowan House. 
Uh, and same thing, I agree that I'd prefer the city not be in, in the landlord business, but uh, I look at two benefits to selling that. Number one, we can put that in the hands of a private person with the proper restrictions that it be maintained as a historical home. I think that's obviously number one. Uh, I think that would satisfy the intent of, of Mrs. McGowan's uh, gift to the city. Second of all, any money received from the sale of that would be restricted in the future for only use for uh, restricted for historical building and preservation purposes. So I would have no intent, would not support the sale of it if the money just went into the general fund. So I think the money has to be earmarked, put into a separate fund and restricted for historical uh, purposes that would also have to be defined. So I think that gives a group uh, in our town some money that they can plan to be be proactive for activities instead of being reactive. I think with the two houses over here, we were reactive. I think in the future, we can be a little more proactive if that group has some money in that fund uh, that they can utilize. And how that would be utilized can all be discussed and defined in the future. So those are the two bullet points, uh, I think, and why I would consider that the city should consider selling the McGowan House. Good, thank you. That's a great thought. I think it's certainly worth discussing, looking into. Um, I like the thought, the idea of um, using the funds to um, um, be more, be able to be more proactive in terms of historic preservation. The history of this town is very important to a lot of people, um, and um, it's 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 a really a great thought. Uh, we'd have to really uh, be careful and make sure we're doing it correctly in terms of how we uh, ensure the um, intent of Mrs. McGowan um, is, is guaranteed. And, you know, uh, simple restrictive covenants on a deed expire after 21 years. Um, so we'd have to be careful. We'd have to figure out how to make sure that that continues beyond that time uh, to, to to um, honor the intent of the gift, so. Uh, and I, there's, it's not something to me that there's any type of a particular timeline on. Uh, certainly we'd like to reach out to Mildred's survivors and let them know what we would intend to do. Um, and then uh, we do actually have a grant application out on the house right now to Lynn County for some, they have a historic preservation grant program that they do to try to do some window repairs that uh, Main Street helped us put together. So we'd like that process to, pay, to play out as well to see if we're successful in getting those funds. Great. Yes, sir. One of the things that we could also consider is I know other municipalities have them, and that is, is um, you know, I, I've had conversations about endowments uh, before where some cities have endowments for um, trust purposes or <clears throat> estate planning purposes, but another one would be we, we could look at possibly doing an endowment for a preservation or historical uh, district. That would be something as well, too. It would have its own parameters as to how that those proceeds would actually go to and there may be also people that would want to continue contributing to it going forward into the future um, that would help um, seed some of those projects in the future as well too so this will be an ongoing issue for our city but that may be something else that we could take a look at as well anyone else yes sir you kind of talked you had talked about what I was going to bring up is how in the future do we you know, guarantee that it's used for, for not, used for something that it shouldn't be or lose the historical value of the home because what happens three, if it tra trades hands three times in the next 20 years and then we got someone in there that owns it that, you know, if there were covenants in place that expired and then they can do what they want with it and, you know, you go for it, get run down or whatnot. So that was my concern with, with selling it. So we'd have to, I'm sure what I'm can be done. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Kara can come up with some options for us. Yeah, at this point we hadn't even really engaged it because I didn't know how, what level of support there was on council for looking at something like that. But that'd be the next step for us. I think the principle that um, the city shouldn't be in the landlord business is probably mm -hmm. I think uh, something that everybody agrees on by consensus. But, yes. but we want to make sure that, that it's done right if we're going to be turning the property into private hands, make sure that's okay with the family and 
and that it's done in the correct way to honor the donor's wishes going forward. So, okay, is that is that accurate for everyone? Okay, thank you. Do you have one more item, Don? Yeah, I have the next one as well. Um, I had put in the council packets a draft of a request for proposals relating to 1204 7th Avenue. Um, while we have done joint RFPs before, it has not been with a private sector uh, company. So this would be kind of the first of its kind. But one of the things that we've run into, obviously, uh, 1204 was our least successful project that we've had to date. And it hasn't really gone anywhere on its own, um, just leaving it out there with the private sector to be able to handle it. One of the obstacles that we have identified is that any time um, a company has come forward to look at that project, um, we've made them run through our normal um, economic development application process. And that does take a while. I mean, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. So in addition to their normal due diligence, they're running through that process parallel to it at the same time. And every time we've reviewed it, we've always come to about the same conclusion on the appropriate level of city incentives that it was going to need to make that project work. So when we were talking about it with the Economic Development Committee and our economic development professionals in town, uh, we thought, well, what would happen if we took that joint RFP concept and married it to this property as well to see if we could actually jumpstart it so that um, the bank as the owner and their realtor um, would actually have the tool to be able to go out when they're sitting down with a prospective buyer and say, hey, this property's already been reviewed and it's pre-approved um, for this level of incentive uh, to try to kickstart that project and move it forward. Also, I've done some work internally with planning and building to get a better understanding of what we know about the site. So, for example, we know where it's at with environmental environmental contamination and the status it has with the DNR as far as a no further action letter. Uh, we know what building inspection is competent is there, can be reused for infrastructure like the exterior foundations. We also know where they have questions, things that have to be investigated. So we're trying to remove as many of those question marks or contingencies for uh, anyone who would want to come in and take over the project before they even get started. The idea would be is we already have a set of plans that's pre-approved, a building design that's pre-approved approved. It's been through the, the building inspection, fire, the uh, IDO process that someone could just come in, pick up those plans and move that project forward and get it done. So, uh, you know, in considering that it collapsed back in 2013, I think we've been more than patient waiting to see if the private sector could get this thing moved forward. So we want to give it a kick in the pants and see if we can get it going. Wow. Okay. Any questions or comments on that? I, I think it it makes sense. I mean, it's kind of like the shovel-ready concept for the for the MEC. Uh, you know that this is construction-ready, and we have a lot of uh, things already done and in place, so that someone could come in and and do the project. Um, any thoughts on that? And just to, uh, just to remind us, uh, with the prior project and the incentive that was approved there was there was not any incentive actually received by on that project really. not on this site no yeah mm -hmm. correct okay so that would be good for people to know that because we have new people here yep. that weren't involved yeah so if uh, the council's um, in support of that, we would put a resolution authorizing distribution of the joint RFP. That way we can put it on our website, but it would also be available through the commercial real estate firm that they've used, and then they could start marketing it. We can get it out there as soon as we can. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, then we have uh, a closed session on the agenda. Um, can someone make the motion? Um, sorry, make a motion to adjourn to a closed session regarding personal matters. City manager performance evaluation is permitted under section 21.51I of the Code of Iowa. Second. Okay, it's been uh, moved by Councilwoman Atkins and uh, seconded by Councilwoman Gadela to adjourn to closed session regarding personal matters as permitted under section 21.51 I of the Code of Iowa. This is for city manager performance evaluation. Um, 
Well, do we ha Lon, do, do we have your uh, consent to? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And then we need the opinion of our council. I have reviewed the proposed subject matter for the closed session and find the same to be appropriate under Iowa Code Section 21.5, subsection 1, subsection I, to be appropriate. Okay. Well, may we have the roll call vote? Ms. Atkins? Here. Mr. Jensen? Yes. Mayor Abelasley? Yes. Mr. Sternad? Yes. Mr. Brandt? Yes. Ms. Cadelia? Yes. Thank you. We are adjourned to um, the closed session. <laughs>